This is an audiobook that contains two complete books by Daryl Bailey. Book 1. Dismantling the Fantasy and Book 2. Essence Revisited. Book 1. Dismantling the Fantasy. By Daryl Bailey. Introduction. There are no traditions in this. It is not an attempt to convince or to convert. It is a dream questioning itself. Chapter, The Cloud Once upon a time, a group of friends lay on a hillside watching a cloud. They had become fascinated with its appearance while walking in the country. It was a marvelous cloud, massive and surging, one moment appearing to be a house and the next a bevy of balloons. In turn there were forests and cities, animals and people, comings and goings, no end of activity. As it so happened an old man a stranger was wandering close by. When the group of friends saw him, they cried out in their excitement, Old man, come join us. Come watch this cloud. After hurried introductions and the shifting of bodies, he took his place within the group. The afternoon passed pleasantly as the cloud continued to surprise. There were soldiers at war and children at play. There were creatures of the wild, birds, mammals, and fish, as well as beasts of work and burden. There was a mother and her child. There were the many scenes of life, birth, death, sickness, youth, and old age. There were lovers and fighters, friends and enemies, the interaction of groups and single, poignant portraits. Time wore on, the afternoon dwindled, and eventually the old man stood to leave. He thanked his new friends and made his goodbyes, but hesitated, looking at the gathering. May I ask you a question? Was they replied in their various ways. Were you at all concerned for those we saw this afternoon? Who? They asked. The figures we saw in the cloud, the soldiers, the animals, the children. The friends looked at each other perplexed. One answered old man, there were no people, no animals, there was only the cloud. The others nodded in agreement. How do you know that? How do we know what? How do you know there was only the cloud? It's obvious anyone can see it. The what? There is only the cloud, it's still there. What about the forms we saw? There were no forms, there is only the cloud and it has no particular form. How do you know that? Just look and you can see it. What do you see? There are no forms there. How do you know that? Because they're always changing. No form is ever really there. Whatever form you think you see is always altering, rearranging in some way. How do you know that? Just look. That's all you have to do. There were no soldiers, no animals, no children. No. It may have seemed like that, but there was only the cloud. There were no soldiers deciding to fight, no lovers deciding to love. How could those false appearances decide to do anything? There's only the movement of the cloud. So the cloud decides to move? No. The cloud does not decide to move. It has no form. It simply moves. That's its nature. How do you know that? Have you ever seen a cloud that stopped changing? Every aspect of it is shifting in some way. It doesn't decide to do it, it's on automatic. The movement simply happens. There were no people. There was no birth and death. Birth and death of what? There is only the cloud. It seems like many forms coming and going but it's always only the unformed cloud. And no one is deciding to do anything? No. The forms that appear to be there are not really there, because each one is altering in some way and eventually disappears. There is simply action or motion. The forms are not the reality, they are false appearances. There is only movement, a streaming that has no particular form. 
but the lovers who moved closer together. There were no lovers, no soldiers, no animals. There is only the cloud. The old man pondered this slowly. There were no forms there. No decisions to act. No birth and death. That's right, said the friends, thinking they had finally gotten through to him. But how do you know that for certain? Just watch. Forms that you see are changing all the time. They never stop. No particular form is ever really there. If you had to describe a cloud, you wouldn't say it looked like a horse or a soldier. That wouldn't give you a true sense of the cloud. A cloud is constantly changing. The appearance of form is not the reality. The altering is. That's the basic fact. There is no coming or going, no birth or death, no decisions being made, no matter how much it seems like that. There is only motion. Anyone can see that if they watch it long enough. The old man considered this carefully. You're absolutely certain? Yes. We're absolutely certain. And you can tell all of this from seeing this constant change, this motion, this dynamic? Yes. The old man contemplated this. May I ask another question? Friends remained silent, waiting. Are you actually people? What are you talking about? Of course we're people. But you're changing. What? Everything you are, your bodies, thoughts, emotions, interests, urges, desires, capacities, decisions, focuses, ideas, activities, in fact, more than just you, all things that you know of. What about them? They're constantly changing. Yes, sighed the members of the group, they're changing. Do you change them? No, old man, they simply. Silence. The friends stood staring at him, their minds racing, exploding to find some other response. He gazed back at them. They looked. He looked. For what seemed to be a very, very long time. Then he smiled, turned, and wandered away. Chapter. Dialogue 1. Question. Good morning. Daryl. Good morning. Question. I want to ask you some questions regarding your perspective on life. I've heard some of it already, but there are certain aspects I want to clarify. Daryl. Okay, but this is simply my perspective. I don't ask anyone to believe it and I don't expect anyone else to approach life in this way. Question. I understand that. Perhaps I can begin by asking if you see yourself as a spiritual teacher. Daryl, no. Question. But you give spiritual teachings at a local yoga center. Daryl, not exactly. A number of years ago, I was invited to offer my perspective in that setting. With an examination of our direct experience of the moment, in order to discover if the ideas we have about life are actually matching our experience. Question. Though much of what you say sounds like the teachings of Buddhism, Taoism, Advaita and some others. Daryl, yes, in some instances even Christianity. There are portions of those traditions that sound very similar to what I'm saying, as well as portions that don't. Question, but you spent years exploring those traditions. You were a monk, you lived with well-known Buddhist teachers, and you spent time with independent teachers who were generally considered to be enlightened. Daryl, yes. From a very early age, there seemed to be something odd in the process of perception, something I couldn't quite clarify, and this is what attracted me to various meditation traditions and teachers, because they expressed an interest in examining the process of perception. Over the years there were many of them. This current situation at the Yoga Center offers the chance for others to investigate their experience. And there are lots of surprises for anyone who wants to join in. 
It began as an exploration with one friend and has now grown to a larger situation. There are a number of people who say they find it supportive in their daily lives. Some tell me it's a very clear consideration of life. Some say it explains all the traditional spiritual teachings. And some say it's really off the mark. I'm not concerned with any of that. I'm interested in a certain kind of freedom that sometimes arises in this exploration. Question, can you describe that freedom? Daryl, no. Most profound aspects of freedom turn away from defining life. There's eventually no belief in the stories of thought. They're needed for functioning, but the obsessive urge to explain existence falls away. There's no way to convey this freedom by focusing on more explanations. Question, some say if we drop the focus on perception and thought, we come to pure awareness or pure consciousness. Do you agree? Daryl, no. That's just another thought. These are incorrect assumptions about existence. No one ever left the womb thinking they were an awareness or a consciousness. It's a long time for society to program us to think like that. People often object to this kind of statement, saying that to dismiss such things is nihilistic, useless, life-denying, and even damaging. Question, isn't it? Daryl, not in my experience. A reaction like that indicates they don't understand what I'm pointing to. People desperately want to describe existence, and historically, they speak of matter, energy, consciousness, spirit, oneness, and mystery. But, descriptions are merely limited interpretations. All of them. They can never tell us what life actually is. I say there is no matter, energy, consciousness, spirit, oneness, or mystery. This is often misunderstood because people think it's saying there's nothing at all, and that sounds very bleak. Say that life is not mystery, not oneness, not consciousness, not anything. This is not the same as saying there's nothing. It's not pointing to some state of oblivion or bleak emptiness. In fact, it's just the opposite. Try asking a newborn baby whether there is awareness or consciousness. Ask an infant if a world exists. Awareness, consciousness, and world are merely labels taught to us by society long after we leave the womb. For a newborn, there are no things, no definable forms, no labels, no awareness, no body, no mind, and no world. However, this doesn't mean there's nothing. I don't have the impression that a newborn baby is feeling lost and bleak without ideas of awareness, consciousness, or the many other things of life. An infant is a vital, pulsing event, lively, sensitive, alert, and highly responsive. There's nothing nihilistic in that. Ideas don't tell us what life is. They don't even focus on life. They focus on abstract notions of division and comparison, dividing life's constantly vibrant movement into false impressions of static form, describing one false form as different from another. That's how we get the impression of understanding something, it's one form or thing as opposed to some other form or thing. But, calling one portion of the moment awareness and another portion the object of awareness never tells us what the basic happening is. Instead, it gives the mistaken impression that this happening is divided into different forms that can be understood. When you're one hour old, you're not thinking you're an awareness experiencing a world. According to research into child development, it takes seven years to be fully trained to think like that. You may think I'm ultimately saying life is a mystery, but I'm not. Life and mystery are just more labels. To me this is not about coming up with another label. It's not about fixating on another thought. It's about dropping the obsession with thought by seeing its limitations. Question. If we drop the focus on thought, what are we left with? Daryl, motion, 
expressing itself. Question, motion. Daryl, yes. Life is motion accomplishing itself. Perception and thought give us descriptions of form, but at the same time they tell us that forms can't be real. If you observe any form, you find that it's always changing, so it isn't a particular form at all. It's a process of movement and action. The world of perception and thought turns against its own stories and states they can't be true. Everyone's experience of life indicates that motion is truer than the perception of form. A thorough investigation reveals that all things are changing, and eventually replaces the impression of form with a sense of motion that has no particular shape. This action or motion isn't dependent on having a name. At birth we have no labels and life functions anyway. Our so-called bodies and actions function automatically, in an amazingly vital way. Our heads bob, our arms and legs move, we cry, we feed at our mother's breast, and eventually we crawl. We don't plan these things. We don't think them out. There is a mysterious, spontaneous functioning, moving on its own. That's all there is at delivery, and that's all there is now. Descriptions of life make no sense at all. Ideas of different forms in existence, such as objects, events, and beings, are the same as ideas of forms in clouds. Clouds don't have a form. If people tried to convince you that the shapes in a cloud are a stable world with beings and things, you would say it isn't true, because those shapes are obviously fleeting. There is no form there. It only appears to be there. I'm pointing out that it's the same with all of existence. A mountain is certainly thicker than a cloud, but like the cloud it has no lasting shape. I'm not concerned with whether rock seems more substantial than mist. What's important to me is that neither one has form. Each is always changing, and will eventually appear to disappear. Existence has no shape, so it can't be understood as anything in particular. This seems important to note because most people are caught in ideas of cultivating some understanding of existence in order to bring an end to conflict. Even though perception may be useful to a limited degree, it's ultimately a focus on forms where no forms actually exist. Therefore, it's a focus on delusion. It's the frustrating attempt to impose form on motion, the attempt to hold life still, mentally and physically, when life will always push beyond those imposed boundaries. This attempt to resist life's movement is conflict, it can't bring an end to conflict. The obsessive focus on ideas of form is always frustrating, and it makes it impossible to realize something else. Question, which is? Daryl, that everything is indefinable motion. There's no indication anywhere that we govern this action, because we obviously don't create our own movement. We don't create the ongoing, ever-changing movement of our needs, interests, urges, abilities, inclinations, and potential. The fantasy forms in a cloud do not direct the action of that cloud, and the fantasy forms in existence do not direct the action of existence. Question, but this is another thought. Daryl, yes. That's why I say I can't describe the most profound aspects of freedom. The most that perception and thought can do is reveal their own contradictions. Thought simply realizes that it can't describe what we actually experience. Even the idea of experience doesn't apply. If that realization arises, the obsessive focus on perception and thought is dropped. The action that we call perception and thought continues to present itself, but it's a happening that can't be explained in any way at all. Question, how do we get to that? Daryl, we don't have to get to it, we never left it. We are that. All we have to do is wake up to it. Actually, no one needs to wake up to it, but life may unfold in that direction, whether you like it or not. 
When you ask how do we get to that, you're assuming that we're an awareness in a body that can influence life and that somehow we've lost something we need to get back to, that somehow we're separated from our wholeness, separated from our true potential. But, all of that is an illusion based on the appearance of forms. Existence is motion. Whatever we are now, whatever we're doing now, is an inexplicable movement accomplishing itself. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. When I speak of this mysterious action or movement, I'm not pointing to something that we need to develop or cultivate, nor am I pointing to something we need to get to. I'm simply saying this is what already is. People who are trying to get rich or become famous are simply move that way. And the people who lead charitable lives or undergo an apparent spiritual awakening are moved in that way. Question, but it's influenced by various things, by people and events. Daryl, it appears that way, but if we examine the behavior of those various things, people, and events, we find they're compelled to move in the way they do by their intrinsic nature. And we're compelled to respond to them in the way we do by our intrinsic nature. It's changing all the time usually in subtle ways but sometimes radically. We're not locked into one mode of responding. The manner in which this happening will display itself next is ultimately unpredictable. There are general patterns, but they never repeat themselves exactly. As a newborn, there was a mysterious happening that required no willful effort or understanding. This has never left. There was no you doing anything then. There's no you doing anything now. Question. How would someone live with that sense of things? Daryl, just as we are now. There isn't anyone doing the seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling and thinking. It's an automatic functioning. There actually isn't any seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling or thinking. These are acquired labels and mistaken notions of division and form. What we call our biology, our neurology, our glands, our brains, our hearts, these are functioning automatically. They're a process accomplishing itself. Your heart isn't asking, how should I beat? It's simply moving. You might tell me that you're different from your heart, that you are self-aware or self-conscious and your heart isn't. I'm saying that no one is self-aware or self-conscious. The idea of a self that is knowing existence, or directing the movement of existence, is a delusion of thought. It's self-delusion. If you sit down and make no effort at all, life happens anyway. The ever-shifting process that you are simply functions. The heart keeps beating, the breath keeps breathing, the moods keep mooding. Thoughts and urges come and go. Some are followed. Some are not. This dynamic simply happens. At some point, you will stand up, you will go to the toilet, you will eat, sleep, work, relate to others. You will relate to the world in the only way that feels right to you or makes sense to you. When I say feels right or makes sense, I don't just mean intellectually, but also emotionally, physically, spiritually, and psychologically, the entire package. You will act in the only way you can. There's no you that can stop it or guide it. Everything you are is simply this mysterious happening. We have always been an inexplicable dynamic. There is no person and no thing separate from this dynamic. Question, what about free will? Daryl, the descriptions of a self in a world, of doing and being, of past, present and future, path and goal, ignorance and enlightenment, free will and fate, these ideas do not apply to what is. They're built around ideas of form and we can't find any stable form. Question, but we can't live without thought. Daryl, no and we don't have to, but perhaps we can stop believing its delusions. A map may be useful at times, but you don't believe that a map is actually the land that it describes. When you go on vacation, 
You don't spread a map on the floor, sit on it and think you've gone somewhere. Thoughts may also be useful, but focusing on the stories of thought, and believing they're explaining a reality, is exactly the same as sitting on a map and thinking you've gone somewhere. Question, so this unformed happening, what is it? Daryl, there's no way of saying. Question, well then what's it doing? Daryl, there's no way of saying. Question, I find that hard to accept. Daryl, this isn't about acceptance. It's about acknowledging life as it is. All that's ever known are descriptions of form where no form actually exists. These descriptions may be helpful at times, but they're ultimately meaningless. There can be no true description of anything. When we came out of the womb there was this, de gestures to everything around. It had no name and no particular sense of form. Now there's the mistaken impression that it has name and form, and we think that's reality. Freedom has nothing to do with developing acceptance. We like to have cozy stories. One of them is that we're someone on a journey to some wonderful spiritual goal, and we slowly develop our spiritual capacity to attain that goal. But, the idea that there is a path, a goal and someone walking the path is false. Life isn't definable. People often think they can let their senses experience the world purely, that they can come to some kind of pure knowing without thought. But, the idea of the senses and something being sensed, the idea of pure knowing, is just another thought. There is the desire to be a knowing, and to have something to know, to have an observer and something observed. But these ideas of form and separation are false. There's just this, de gestures to everything around and to himself. It's empty of form. It's empty of message. Question, but how do you know that? Daryl, the world of thought may eventually realize that its descriptions don't apply. The statement that they don't apply is simply perception and thought pointing to their many contradictions. The illusion realizes its stories can't be true, and the obsessive focus on those fantasies falls away. Question, how do I see the indefinable motion? Daryl, if we sit down and give up all efforts to do anything, if we make no effort to think or to act, motion will reveal itself. The movement that we are, and the larger movement that existence is, will simply present itself. It's quite obvious. Body sensations, thoughts, emotions, interests, urges, mental activities and so on, present themselves automatically, without conscious effort, without a director. Even the sense of conscious effort and direction arises without effort. Everything we observe is changing in some way. If all forms are changing, it becomes obvious that existence has no particular form. Question, why do we think we're separate from it and somehow doing it? Daryl, there's no explanation for that. Most people are simply not interested in examining these false views. Some people find it incredibly important and others do not. Question, what about concentration? Daryl, concentration? Question, Yes, the cultivation of concentration. How important is that? Daryl, if it's important to you I would say it's important. If not, then it isn't important. Question, but as far as spiritual awakening is concerned. Daryl, there isn't any awakening. Question, no awakening. Daryl, Descriptions don't apply to what's happening here, not even the description of spiritual awakening. Question, but to know that is awakening. Daryl, no. To know that descriptions don't apply is the end of belief in any description. The words descriptions do not apply are not describing anything. Thought is simply realizing its limitations. The dream is dismantling itself, 
but that does not say anything about what actually is. The attempt to describe any existence stops because the belief that it can be described ends. Even the description of awakening is dismissed. We are always personalizing, historicizing, psychologizing, scientizing, philosophizing, spiritualizing, and so on. All of these are false stories. Question, so even this discussion is ridiculous. Daryl, I wouldn't say it's ridiculous. It simply happens. There's no way of knowing what's going on here. We can call it a conversation between two people, but that's false, and there's no way of giving any true description. Question, well then, what about the development of concentration as a method for awakening? Daryl, the idea that you need to practice something for a so-called awakening to occur is based on the fantasy that there is you controlling a world. But, the belief in that fantasy has to end for any so-called awakening to occur, because stories about forms of any kind are false. You don't need to be highly concentrated to discover that descriptions don't apply. You just need to be interested in exploring this. There is the general impression that life is divided into separate forms, and that you are a form that needs to manipulate other forms in order to experience union, completion, or wholeness. But, all of that is fantasy. We may start out thinking that we need to develop ourselves in order to get something called awakening or enlightenment. But if it's seen that the stories of form are false, then there is no longer any ignorance or awakening path or goal, journey or arrival. No you, no me, no world, no birth, no death. All of that only exists in fantasy, the world of description. Question, but this observation is also a description. Daryl, yes, it's the world of perception and thought pointing to its own delusion. If it becomes very clear, you can then drop the obsessive focus on that delusion. This moment is a mysterious, vital, radiant expression. No one is doing this expression. It's accomplishing itself. Thing is expressing itself. Hearing is expressing itself. Tactile sensations are expressing themselves. Thought simply arises. The heart beats, hair grows, food digests. The sun rises, the planets turn, the seasons come and go. All of this occurs automatically. This motion is the basis of what we all experience. No one is doing it. It can't be stopped. It has no particular form. No effort is needed for this dynamic to occur. No one has to work to get to this. Everything is already this. There isn't anything that can be separated from this. Nothing can lose this, nothing can gain this. There's only this, D gestures to everything around and to himself. And this has no form. Out of this mysterious, unformed happening apparently rises the notion of form, and the stories begin. The focus isn't on the unformed actuality, the constant motion. Instead, the focus is on illusions of shape. The illusions say, I am an individual form, separate from all the other forms in life, and I have lost something important. I have lost my wholeness, my truth, my completeness, my perfection, and I must search to find happiness. I need to manipulate the world, develop myself, purify myself, and pursue some obscure future goal of union, completion, or enlightenment in order to regain whatever it is I feel I am missing or I have lost. But all of this is a fantasy. In the same way that the apparent forms of a cloud are not the true, unformed nature of the cloud, the apparent forms of existence are not its true nature. There is no stable form that could be classified as a separate self doing its life. There is no form that has lost anything, that has gone the wrong way, or been separated from wholeness or truth. 
In the stories built around the false appearance of form, there is the journey of a self through a physical world over time. There seem to be encounters with family and friends, parents, teachers, employers, spiritual guides and so on. There is a focus on these false descriptions of a self doing things in a so-called world. There is a sense of separation, alienation and dissatisfaction along with the urge to create union and fulfillment. But there is an unavoidable frustration in this because the fantasy of a self can never overcome the feelings of separation, alienation and dissatisfaction. The fantasy of a self builds those feelings. Instead of acknowledging a great, indefinable happening, we fantasize separation, a self desperately searching for union or completion. So the fantasy self pursues its desire for wholeness. It pursues relationship, money, power, education, psychology, therapy, religion, spirituality, yoga techniques, meditation techniques, insight, understanding and so on. But, the sense of completion never comes with any of this because the fantasy of a self-cultivating wholeness can't get rid of the sense of fragmentation and lack. That fantasy is the sense of fragmentation and lack. Perhaps at some point, we begin to question the ideas of form and personal doing. The story of a self doing its life will not stand up to serious examination, and the fantasy will dismantle itself. Life is then without any message. This is not a romantic state of knowing a great mystery. Instead thought is thoroughly stumped. There is complete and utter puzzlement. The effort to know and to do stops and surprisingly existence carries on. Everything proceeds without any imposed effort or understanding. What is called perception thought and willful effort still occurs, but it's obviously an indefinable movement accomplishing itself. This mysterious happening carries no sense of fragmentation or lack. Right now, if you make no effort at all, there is what we call the happening of this moment, what we call the body-mind awareness thoughts feelings, emotions, interests, urges, aptitudes and abilities, as well as everything else. This happening simply happens. It's not necessary to dwell on defining this happening. The entire process orchestrates itself. In acknowledging this, there is no personal anguish, no focus on fantasized ideas of a you who is suffering, searching, doing, failing and losing, no need to move to fullness, truth, union, completion and satisfaction. There are no self-aggrandizing stories of accomplishment and superiority. There is simply a mysterious process accomplishing itself. Question. Is it some unfeeling state? Daryl, no. Everything you usually interpret as you, the body, mind, thoughts, feelings, interests, loves, concerns, urges, efforts and actions, those still happen, but there's no longer any belief in those descriptions. There's no need to think there's you doing anything or missing anything. There is simply a mysterious, radiant, pulsing event. A miraculous presentation. An endlessly exotic parade. Throughout life we're always thinking in terms of ownership. We're always thinking, this is my life, my body, my wife, my husband, my thoughts, my emotions, my doing, my spiritual journey, my insights, and so on. I have a certain amount of time here and I must use my will to choose to do something useful with my life. And that leads to my successes and my failures. But no owner exists. If we examine the happening that life is, the happening is obvious, but there isn't any owner or any stable thing to be owned. Question, you're asking me to stop believing any idea I've ever had. Daryl, no. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm simply offering my perspective. 
However, if you're interested in examining your ideas of reality, they will eventually have to be rejected, along with every idea that humankind has ever had. Because they describe forms that no one can actually find. Forms are motion. There are those who say that since all views are merely relative viewpoints, they're all relatively true, but this is not so. Since all views are based on forms that no one can find, none of them apply. What is is a happening that refuses description of any kind. A dynamic that requires no conscious effort or understanding. When this perspective is offered, it sounds as though it's describing existence but it's not. It's dismantling all descriptions. The real isn't found in forms and labels. Describing a form that doesn't exist, and giving it a name doesn't tell us anything about anything. Even though descriptions may be useful at times, they are a totally distorted impression of what's happening here. Question, all of this sounds right to me, but I'm getting confused. At the same time that it makes sense to say there is no possible understanding, I can feel myself wanting to understand, in order to get free. It's as though the mind wants to sneak up on itself even when it knows it doesn't exist. Daryl, yes that's the power of delusion. It can see its own fantasy and yet wants to go on attaching to it. This is natural so I would suggest that you not fight it. There's no need to force this. It's enough to get a basic sense of it. If it makes sense to you the dismantling will happen on its own. To begin it requires nothing more than listening to this view I'm offering. This view is also a fantasy, but it will dismantle itself. We can stop for now and if you're still interested we can pick it up again tomorrow. For now you can set it aside, relax, go for a walk, have something to eat, whatever seems appropriate. Chapter Dialogue 2 Daryl, Good Morning Question Good morning. Daryl, how are you? Question, I'm fine but I'm still confused. Daryl, that's natural. The important aspect of this investigation is to keep it simple. We're usually so absorbed in complicated stories that it's difficult to come back to basics. There is a wrong assumption about life that occurs at the most basic level of perception. That wrong assumption contains a huge amount of mental anguish. No matter how much I say this, it has no value unless you can see it in your own experience. So let's look at that. Everyone's experience of existence is the happening of the present moment. It doesn't matter who you are, the present moment is your basic sense of life. Even if you're remembering the past or imagining the future, it's happening now. Everyone has a sense of being, the impression that something is present now, existing now, happening now. This sense of existing disappears on a regular basis. Whether we like it or not, the sense of existing disappears every day. We call that sleep. Sleep automatically moves into dreaming and dreaming moves on to become deep sleep. Deep sleep eventually moves into waking up and there is a vague sense of having had a good or bad night. All of this happens without your efforts. In fact, you can't stop it from happening. Your most basic sense of life presence itself is a constant movement, waking, dreaming, sleeping, waking, dreaming, sleeping, and so on. Each state moves through its various stages to complete its cycle. In the sleep state, there is no sense of form, not even a sense of being. In the dream state, the apparent forms are obviously fleeting. They are not what we would call reality. In the waking state, however, it appears that there are real forms. But if we bother to pay attention to them, every form that we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, and mentally observe, is also changing. Sights, sounds, touches, tastes, smells, and mental activities are constantly altering. Some slowly, some quickly. More than that, 
the senses themselves are shifting. Being, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, and thinking are constantly shifting predominance. Awareness doesn't have a particular form. One moment there is seeing, the next hearing, the next thinking, and so on. At times, there is a sense of clear attention, and at other times the attention wanders. It's foggy and dull. Attention may be broad and expansive or narrow and tightly focused. It might be open and receiving or refusing and resistant. It's constantly shifting. Added to this, the sense organs are altering. It doesn't matter who you are, every portion of your body is altering as it either matures or degenerates. Not only can we view this in our bathroom mirror, but scientists tell us that, over the course of seven years, every cell in the body is replaced. Every cell dies and is replaced. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Jew, a Muslim, or a scientist, an artist, a business person, a philosopher, and so on, this fact of change is ultimately your experience. The sense organs, the senses, and all the objects ever sensed have no particular form. Even if you've never paid any attention to this, with a serious investigation it becomes obvious. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about thoughts, emotions, bodies, the weather, a house, a mountain, a planet, or a galaxy, everything is changing, even as we consider it. It becomes obvious that existence is not just changing, it's constantly changing. Things that change very slowly, such as a house, a mountain, or a solar system, do not stay exactly the same for hundreds of years and then grow old overnight. They are shifting now, and even though we can't see every subtle movement, there is the impression that they are changing in small ways. They are flowing. Very slowly. In faster movements, such as the flow of consciousness, there appear to be many individual thoughts arising and passing, but try to stop one of those thoughts, to simply observe it, and we find no solid object, only a continuous streaming like smoke. That streaming will even disappear as we attempt to watch it. Even though we have the impression that individual thoughts are there, there is only a constant altering. In swirling smoke, it's quite obvious that, even as we attempt to identify a particular pattern or form in the movement, the pattern has already changed. Obviously, no particular object exists in that motion. There is only a continuously streaming display. Mountains are more deceptive, but they're also changing. Just because a mountain flows at a much slower rate does not mean that it has any more form than smoke. Mountains become hills and eventually fade away. The amazing thing about this is that everyone experiences this fact of change, this streaming without seeing its significance. We are forever complaining about our behavior, our health, our relationships, our work, the economy, the educational system, the government and so on, and the complaints center on the fact that all things, for periods of time, change in ways that are unpleasant. We cling to the illusion of form, physical forms, mental forms, emotional forms, situational forms, structural forms, temporal forms and relational forms, but they never stop changing. So we complain. No matter how much we want to cling to an apparent form of health, mood, state of mind, behavior, relationship, understanding, career and so on it alters. Because existence has no particular form. Here we find the basic agony of life. We believe there are stable forms when, in fact, there is merely unstoppable, unpredictable motion. If forms are described, whether mental, physical, emotional, structural, situational, temporal, relational, and so on, they are essentially an illusion. We attempt to impose form where no form exists. 
Since portions of existence move at different rates, some fast and some slow, certain aspects appear to be relatively solid and stable, and it is beneficial, in a limited way, to identify them as separate forms and to speak as if those forms actually exist. Identifying forms in smoke isn't that important, but it's very helpful to identify the form of a salt shaker, a person, a car, or a mountain, even though they, like swirls and smoke, will eventually fade away. It's also beneficial to identify various cycles in movement. One such cycle is a rhythm of highs and lows. Note this general rhythm is helpful because we don't get overly concerned when life is on a downward trend. All we need to do is wait. An upward trend is coming at some point. Question, but any form we try to describe would actually be false because it's constantly altering. And anything we cling to eventually brings conflict because it's changing beyond our control. Daryl, yes. And more importantly, no one is doing this movement. We could say it happens automatically because it simply happens. No one is doing it and no one can stop it. Existence is an unformed flow. This flow is mistakenly perceived as the birth and death of many things. Thoughts, moods, interests, urges, understandings, bodies, activities, relationships, careers, seasons, planets, galaxies, and so on. These forms don't actually exist, they're like ripples in flowing water. We can say that everything is changing, but that isn't accurate, because no form has ever existed that could possibly change. What is, and always has been, is unform. In the same way that the movement of nature simply happens, with seasons shifting, rain falling and flowers growing, the process that we are our so-called bodily process, mental process, and behavioral process simply happens. All that is ever experienced is a mysterious, unformed action. We can't truly describe any qualities because to identify a quality is to identify form. Even the terms flow, motion, and stream are not describing the presence of anything. They are pointing to unform. Existence is not a form of any kind, therefore it's not a sun, a moon, the stars, a person, a body, a mind, a beginning, an ending, a coming, a going, a this world or an other world. It's not a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It is not heat or cold matter or energy, space or the absence of space. It's not consciousness. Scientists are forever searching for a particle that makes up the universe, but all they find is process. Now we have quantum physics stating there are no things, there is only process. What is can never truly be described because its shape or display never holds still. We describe ourself in terms of a body and a mind, but these are more accurately observed as motion. Minds and bodies are constantly altering in gross or subtle ways. Even if we make no effort whatsoever, mental activities continue and bodily processes flow on. Everything ages. That's motion. We think in terms of various things influencing each other, as though there really are things. We speak of cause and effect, of one thing causing another, or of one thing being affected by another. But, this is like looking at the surface of a river, and believing there are various ripples influencing each other. There are no separate ripples. There is only the moving and shifting of one body of water. In considering this, some will get the impression that we're being pushed around by the flow of nature, but this is not so. Ripples are not pushed around by the movement of water, because ripples are the movement. Try to catch a ripple and all you find is moving water. Try to grab anything in life and all you find is motion that can't be identified as anything in particular. This movement isn't from a past to a present and a future. The past is the idea that certain forms once existed. 
The present is the idea that a different set of forms exists now. The future is the idea that still other forms will exist at some point. But the dance that existence is never has form, it only appears to have form. This deceiving appearance gives the false impression of a past changing to a present and then changing again to a future. There is no change, there is always only a mysterious unform. This isn't saying that life has no substance, it's saying that what is has no form. Form is an abstraction, it is not real. We have illusions of form, of self, world, things, free will, determinism, time, space, logic, cause, effect, personal conditioning, purpose, inhibitions, fears, defense mechanisms, insight, understanding, and so on, but none of these actually exist. These descriptions of form are false, they do not apply to what we experience. Question, but most of us believe we are something, separate from other things in existence, a thing in a world of things. We believe that we're someone who's capable of manipulating life, someone who's influencing the world around us, someone who was born and will die, someone who has been conditioned by good or bad parenting, someone who's not living up to their potential, someone who needs to do better through his or her efforts, and someone who never feels good enough, but hopes to, in some proposed future. Daryl, exactly. If those stories are believed, if those false descriptions are believed to be true, there's an incredible amount of emotional anguish that comes with them. If however, the realization arises that there is no form, then the process of perceiving form, and all the stories about form are ultimately meaningless. Thought describes form where no form actually exists, and may be used as a tool when it's helpful, but ignored when it's not. Thought never causes or affects the movement of life, it's merely a tiny portion of that movement. Thought certainly doesn't describe any truth, so we don't need to obsessively focus on it or lose sleep over it. If you believe that your descriptions of life are true, then existence will contain a great deal of mental anguish around the story of a poor little you who is struggling in a cold alien world, struggling to understand and control. You will constantly try to figure it out, to assess it with endless thinking, going to various therapies and therapists, doing various practices, hoping to understand existence, so that somehow you can escape the anguish of your story. But, all of this is merely obsessing over the story and the anguish. If, however, you realize that none of the stories apply, and the tight focus on them falls away, what remains is an amazingly mysterious happening that requires no effort or explanation. There is simply the unformed, indefinable, pulsing, luminous expression of now. Nothing born. Nothing dying. Nothing incomplete. Nothing incorrect. Nothing unfulfilled. This mysterious happening is not our doing. We in everything else are its expression. In this moment, it is what it is, and it's unavoidably on its way to a different expression. There's no possible way of defining it and no possible way of knowing exactly what's coming next. Question. How would anyone come to see this? Daryl, by investigating the present moment. Sit down, make no effort to breathe, to think, to listen, to feel, or to observe. Make no effort to be anything, do anything, or understand anything, and everything happens anyway. There's only a mysterious happening that has no particular form. We don't have to spend the rest of our lives sitting still, but it's only when we're doing nothing that it becomes obvious all of existence is moving itself. And it's only when we stop focusing on the false appearances of form that it becomes obvious existence has no form. No one has to do it, describe it or understand it, and it all happens anyway. The breath goes on breathing. The heart goes on beating. 
body sensations buzz and swirl. Thoughts go on thinking, moods go on mooding, food digests, hair grows, and the body ages. At some point, there is a getting up, moving around, eating, sleeping, going to the toilet, making a living, relating to others, and so on. There is this automatic function or expression. It is a process accomplishing itself. When you wake up in the morning, immediately the process that you are pushes itself forward with no effort at all. Even the waking up isn't your doing. The particular needs that you are, the particular interests that you are, push themselves forward. All of the interpretations are there: the sense of self, desires, hopes, regrets, urges, and efforts. But waking has not truly happened. Awareness has not happened. Consciousness has not happened. Knowing has not happened. Body has not happened. Birth has not happened. Sleep has not happened. Parents have not happened. Children have not happened. Conditioning has not happened. Decisions have not happened. Mistakes have not happened. Birth has not happened. Humankind has not happened. These stories are not true. These are descriptions of form where no form exists. Question: But I have a husband and children, parents, friends, obligations, a job. I can't just say they don't exist. I can't walk away from all of that. How would I live as a mysterious happening? Daryl, there's no problem. You don't have to figure out how to be the mysterious happening. You're already the mysterious happening, no matter what the situation. It's not dependent on what you're doing or thinking. The difficulty is not in your particular life situation or in having a story. The difficulty is in believing the stories. You're able to tell stories based on the apparent forms in a cloud. You could tell stories about them all day long and never think they describe a real world of forms, because it's obviously a cloud and it has no particular shape. If it becomes obvious that existence has no form, then it doesn't matter if you think in terms of a husband, a wife, children, parents, career, and so on. No matter how much those ideas are there, or how helpful they may be, you will not believe they're truly describing life. The various storylines automatically present themselves, but they're not true. There's no possible way of knowing what any of this is. We can't even truly say this is. Question: Then how am I supposed to act, Daryl? In whatever way you're expressed, just be what you are in any particular moment. The movement that you are is expressing itself right now. The automatic movement of needs. Interests, urges, perceptions, thoughts, understandings, abilities, and actions. You're already it. You're not doing it. There is no you who can avoid it or get it wrong. There is only a mysterious river expressing itself. In any particular moment, there may be numerous urges pulling in many directions, but there will be one particular priority that pushes itself forward. Overpowering the others, whether it's sitting still, going to the toilet, pursuing a career, chasing a relationship, being confused, or waking from delusion, doesn't really matter. All of it is an incomprehensible movement. We can't say anyone does this dynamic or directs this dynamic because all that's ever experienced is this dynamic. We have absolutely no possible way of knowing what's going on here. But it happens anyway. What arises with this realization is wonder at the endless mystery of it, the miraculous gifting of it. All of life is a gift. I'm not saying that with this realization, life is always pleasant. It still carries tremendous pains and difficulties. If the focus does fall away from the stories of form and realizes the indefinable river. There may be a period of fear, sadness, and depression as belief in the stories fades away. There may be a sense of losing many valuable things like self-importance, personal relationship, and control. You might feel there's no point in living. 
but you will not lose anything valuable. All that's lost is illusion and its related agonies. As the process continues, the sense of loss is replaced by a sense of wonder and amazement. Existence is a mysterious gifting. There will be a waiting in wonderment as everything, including the process that you are, simply displays itself. All of life displaying itself with no effort on anyone's part. External circumstances and all the internal responses to circumstance simply happen. It's one mysterious movement. For the people around you, it will appear as though you lead an ordinary life more easygoing perhaps, but still exhibiting many qualities that any human being exhibits. For you, however, there is no you, no others, no body, no mind, no world, no doing, no birth, no death, and so on, no sense of fragmentation or lack. There is no obsessive focus on these false ideas. This is similar to taking your focus away from a movie. If you were in a theater watching a movie with many other people, all of you would be caught in the thrill of the story, the various characters, the births and deaths, the joys and sorrows, the anxieties and fears, the highs and lows of emotion. You would be absorbed in a story with all of the wild emotions it produced. But, if your focus falls away from the screen, all of that is gone. Instead, there is a dark room filled with people watching color dancing on a wall. The movie hasn't ended, but you're no longer focused on that fantasy world. You're not caught in the fantasies and emotions that the others are feeling. There is the impression that the room is the reality and compared to the melodrama of the movie, the room is very peaceful. The movie would continue without your efforts and from time to time it would attract your attention. The fantasy world would arise again. The moving colors once again become a world of people, adventure, crisis, and trauma until that focus falls away. Even when caught in the movie and experiencing the wild storm of emotion it generates, you don't take it too seriously because it's just a movie. It's the same in realizing the unformed, pulsing, luminous dance of existence. If the focus falls away from thought and away from the false appearances of form, if it comes to the entire happening of the moment, there is simply an unformed, inexplicable movement. The thoughts don't end. They continue to happen automatically, a small portion of a larger happening of sights, sounds, touches, tastes and smells. A dance of light and dark, sound and silence, twinges, pulsations, waves of energy, moods and so on. All of it, including thought, is a mysterious movement happening on its own. The thoughts will continue to come and go without effort and will often be the focus of attention. They will describe their fantasies of form and may generate wild emotions but there is the underlying acknowledgement that these stories of form can't possibly be true. They can't be applied to what is. With complete realization of this, even when the attention gets attracted to the false stories and the wild emotions they generate, none of it is taken too seriously. It's a fantasy. If the stories of thought are believed to be true, they must generate conflict, because they only function in terms of form, and form doesn't exist. Thought tries to impose form where none exists, to impose understanding where none exists. This imposition is always frustrated, and that's conflict. If, however, there is only movement, a movement that no one is doing and no one can possibly explain, there can't be any conflict. It's no more conflicting than lying on a river bank watching the water flow by. Sometimes the river is wild and raging. Sometimes it's peaceful. In all cases it's a river being a river, it's not a problem. Life isn't a problem to be understood or solved, it's a river flowing. If for some reason you believe you're separate from it, and that somehow you're doing it, there will be a huge amount of mental anguish. 
people generally believe that everything is moved by the laws of nature. We don't believe that planets guide their own orbit or that a bird decides to have a career as a bird. We don't believe that storms decide to be storms or that bears decide to be bears. We don't believe that a plant or a rock is planning how to be a plant or a rock. A plant isn't figuring out how to move as a plant. A rock isn't worrying about whether it's rocking correctly. We don't have the impression that it's feeling guilty for being the rock that it is. We believe that everything in existence is moved by the laws of nature. Everything is a movement of the cosmos. Everything. Except for us. For some reason we think we move the cosmos. We think we move our lives. Doesn't that seem strange to you? Question. It does seem strange, somewhat self-absorbed. Perhaps at this point we could approach the subject of enlightened beings. Daryl, certainly, but I'm wondering if we could continue tomorrow. I'm feeling very tired, and it seems as though we've covered quite a bit today. Question. Tomorrow's fine. Chapter. Dialogue 3. Question. Good morning. Daryl. Good morning. Question. Shall we continue? Daryl. Yes. Question. As I said yesterday, I want to get into this matter of enlightened beings. Daryl. In my sense of things, there are no enlightened beings. Once thought realizes its limitations, it doesn't attempt to describe an existence of any kind. It's just this, D gestures to everything around into his own body. There's no interest in defining it. In my experience, people are always looking for something extraordinary in their spiritual quest. Intense concentration, psychic flashes, visions of inner or outer light, energy releases, deep relaxation, special insights, wisdom, compassion, enlightenment, and so on. They believe there's some great freedom to be attained in chasing these things. For me, these things may be pleasant or interesting if they arise, but they have nothing to do with freedom. Anyone pursuing them is always left yearning for the next special experience because these things are short-lived. Special experiences, rushes of energy, visions, insights, and so on, are merely false appearances of form. There's nothing stable in them. There is only an altering that has no particular shape, and we can't possibly grasp it mentally or physically. Once it's realized that thoughts can't describe a reality, they are important only as a tool for functioning. Like a hammer. We can use a hammer in many ways, but we wouldn't ask it to describe something called reality, because it can't do that. We can use thought in many ways, but I wouldn't ask it to describe something called reality, because it also can't do that. Thought still happens, but there's no obsession with its fantasies. There is no desperate urge to explain a reality. There is no impression of knowing anything. Whether we attempt to describe life or not makes no difference to its movement. It simply moves. We could stand by a river all day long and never attempt to describe it, but the river will flow anyway. The same is true of life, and that flow includes the automatic movement of thought. Question. So much for enlightened beings. Daryl. Sorry. Question. No, no, it's fine. I'm getting used to this. Daryl. One of the difficulties in relating to this is the desire to reach some goal. Most people think they need to reach some understanding or get some particular thing in order to feel complete. It's my experience that a sense of wholeness is not about gaining anything or coming to any understanding. When you watch a cloud, you don't need to make that cloud happen. You don't need it to be something in particular. You don't need to understand it as a world of things. It's simply a beautiful and wondrous expression, sometimes dark and stormy, 
most times big and bouncy. It's the same with all of life. Everything that has ever occurred has been an indefinable, wondrous expression. It's not and never was a bunch of people doing things. What's fascinating is motion itself. All apparent physical and mental forms simply happen. The process never stops rearranging itself. Look at the birds and the flowers. Do they have to make effort to get their appearance, their abilities, their circumstances, and their responses to circumstance? Do birds and flowers have to figure out how to be birds and flowers? They simply are what they are, and it's always changing automatically. It just happens. It's the same for everything in nature. Why do we think we're expressed in a different way? Also, look at the lives of some of the great spiritual teachers. Christ was ridiculed, tortured and died nailed to a cross. The Buddha endured excruciating back pain, famine, attacks from family, attempts on his life, and eventually died of food poisoning after an extended period of vomiting and diarrhea. Why is anyone hoping that their own life is going to be a constantly golden event? Everything is given, but it's a wide variety of gifts, half of which we don't want. It doesn't really matter what the mind wants. A river flows to its current and not to the wants of a ripple. Question, how do I know what's given? What if something's given and I'm not seeing it properly? What if I go in the wrong direction? Daryl, whatever happens is what's given. We can't go in a wrong direction because everything we are and any response we've ever had is also what's given. Everything you are is an expression of the river. In my experience, it's incorrect to think that the gift is only the pleasant, the joyful, the clear, the whole, and the kind. All the confusion, sorrow, anger, fragmentation, wars, plagues, famine, and the responses to them are also the gift. The many years of yearning, searching, failing, and stumbling in darkness are given along with periods of clarity, peace, success, and living in the light. That's the full gifting of a rich life. It's recorded that an old teacher, I think it was Rinzai, could be heard rising in the morning. There were the sounds of a huge belly laugh, shutters being thrown open, and his shouting over the countryside, What have you got for me today? His heart was open to whatever was offered. All of it was a fascinating parade of inexplicable, passing situations, some pleasant, some not, but he had no fear of it because it was an incomprehensible happening, a mysterious, magical movement, and it included his own being. We are this mysterious happening and nothing can ever harm it. The false appearances of form come and go, they suffer and die. They can be viewed as adequate or inadequate, successes or failures. But, the unformed happening that actually is never comes or goes. It simply is. Question, who's giving the gift? Daryl, a giver, a gift, and a gifting don't actually exist. Life's happening can't be described, but perception and thought refer to it in many ways. Perception always fantasizes three basic forms, a subject, an object, and some relationship between them. It's the idea of a self, a world, and their relationship. A knower, a known, and a knowing. A giver, a gift, and a gifting. All of it is the same repeating pattern of a subject and object and some relationship between them. This basic illusion of form is found in our sentence structure of subject, object, and verb, but none of these descriptions actually apply to the happening that everyone experiences. Question, could we talk about meditation? Daryl, certainly. Question, what is meditation? Daryl, from this perspective, meditation is the simple expression of the moment. Meditation is the river of now expressing itself, a happening accomplishing itself. 
To realize this happening, it's necessary to drop the obsessive focus on the fantasies of doing and thinking. In a period of free time, we set aside any need to be doing and thinking. Nothing needs to be accomplished. The attention then has permission to rest with the entire happening of the moment. It doesn't need to be focused totally on thought. It can rest with other aspects like seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Not those words, but the happening they refer to. Once the narrow focus on doing and thinking is dropped, the broader, mysterious happening of the moment reveals itself. With a tight focus on thinking and doing, we can never acknowledge life's mysterious movement. Instead, we attach to illusions of form, fragmentation, complexity, control, and conflict. Only in meditation do we realize an inherent wholeness, simplicity, and ease. There is no other situation that truly moves away from fragmentation, alienation, conflict, struggle, and despair. When I say meditation, I'm not talking about meditation techniques or any particular posture. There are many techniques and postures that people use in an attempt to step out of their fantasies of doing and knowing. But techniques and postures are not meditation. When we came out of the womb, there were no ideas of a person doing and knowing life. Existence simply expressed itself without interpretation. In meditation, there is no need to focus on false stories. There is only motion accomplishing itself, and the passing stories are a portion of that flow. This mysterious happening is acknowledged regularly. It becomes increasingly more difficult to define it. It drops the false assumptions of a self and a world of knowing and doing. It drops the ideas of an observer and something observed. It drops the ideas of judgment and measurement. There is no success or failure. No awareness. The focus on these deluded interpretations falls away. Life simply happens without needing to be defined in any way at all. The movement we call perception and thought still happens, but there isn't any obsessive focus on its stories. It becomes obvious there has never been anything to describe or define or experience. There is only an indefinable happening. Initially, it seems like there is a me sitting down to let this mysterious happening express itself, a me sitting to meditate. But once it's realized there is only indefinable motion, there is no longer any meditator or meditation. There is only action, a happening that doesn't need to be done or understood. There are so many descriptions, historic, religious. Scientific, new age, philosophic, poetic, spiritual, and so on. But the obsessive focus on description and the belief that it's describing truth is a huge burden. Our stories are a pile of dead, rotting leaves compared to the vital dynamic that life is. Even thinking in terms of a great cosmos or cosmic consciousness is small and claustrophobic. We most commonly describe our lives in terms of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, and thinking. Each of these has an organ related to it: an eye, an ear, a body, a mouth, a nose, and a brain. And each also has an object related to it: something that is seen, heard, touched, tasted, smelled, or thought. With these three groups of six forms, we have the complete fantasy of a body, a world, and the relationship between them. These false forms give the impression of personal doing and knowing, the fantasy of a me that is doing and knowing its life. Poetically, you could say each of us carries the six 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 stamped in our forehead. The fantasy me becomes the center of a fantasy universe. I did this. I did that. Me first. You can't do that to me. Shut up and listen to me. What about me? Why me? Poor me. Only me. Me me me. My my mine. Gimme gimme gimme. 
It's the human ego provoking all of its greedy, aggressive, self-absorbed, and self-protective behavior. If it's realized that all forms are actually flowing like a river, we're freed from all signs of form, freed from ideas of self, doing, and knowing. These ideas still occur, but there's no belief in them. Question, so then, very specifically, where do I find the river? Where is the mysterious, unformed, automatic, luminous, pulsing dynamic that you talk about? Where is this movement that's moving itself? Daryl, it's the only thing we've ever experienced. It's the only thing we're experiencing now. It's this moment. Sit down and do nothing. You don't even have to focus on thinking and observing. The moment doesn't disappear or fall apart when you make no effort to do it or describe it or observe it. It simply presents itself without effort on anyone's part. Everything is altering. In our daily lives, this isn't immediately obvious because much of the altering is very slow. When our eyes are open, we're focused mainly on that slow movement, and it appears to be unchanging. For example, this house we're sitting in, it doesn't immediately strike you that it has no form. But if you consider that this house, over a long period of time, will eventually dry up, turn to dust, and blow away, that it's not remaining new for hundreds of years and then growing old overnight, you realize it's changing now. It doesn't have any particular form right now. If we sit and close our eyes or lower our gaze away from visual forms, the changing quality of existence is obvious. Movement makes itself known in the shifting thoughts, emotions, sounds, tastes, smells, waves of energy, pulsations, vibrations, and so on that make up the now. Even the attention is dancing around. Everything is doing this on its own. You can't truly describe it as anything in particular. Everything in this ordinary moment is the mysterious, unformed, indescribable river. Since it has no particular form, we could say it's pulsing, radiant, and luminous. These words give a sense of motion, tactile and visual motion. If I speak of a mysterious, unformed, automatic, radiant, luminous, pulsing expression, it's difficult to make any particular form out of it or any particular thing to cling to. Instead, it gives a sense of action, motion, or dance. I could just call it unform, but this is an invitation to explore, and it seems more inviting to step into radiant luminescence than it is to step into unform. Ultimately, my descriptions are false too, but they invite you to step out of description in order to experience a sense of freedom and well-being that is impossible to create or to understand. There's an incredible sense of freedom and well-being in all of this, similar to waking up after a night of deep sleep. In deep sleep, we give up everything. There is no knowing or doing, no wanting, and no possessing. There are no ideas of awareness or observing. The experience of that upon waking in the morning is a feeling of peace and well-being. That sense of peace and well-being is inherent in the process we are. We don't need to create it. My words invite you to step out of the focus on doing and thinking, to experience a freedom and joy that can't be found in any other way. This is the absence of a tight. Constricted focus on false views. It's also the absence of the fears and desperate searching that focus produces. It may be realized that everything rolls along quite fine without attempting to focus on doing and thinking. There is a mysterious, indescribable rolling along. Ideas automatically arise when needed, and our actions do too. Our appearance, direction, and actions simply happen. This realization is freedom. From that point on, there is no meditator, no meditation, no doing, no knowing, and no realization. There is only a mysterious happening that can't be understood in any way.
becomes obvious there has never been anything else. This is a complete opening to the unformed, the undirected, the uncontrolled, the unexpected, and the unpredictable. This openness is often called love. In this, you are not a body, you are not a mind, there is only love. This love is not some cold, intellectual understanding, it's an openness of heart. This love is not an aching, desire-filled attachment to a person, a possession, an idea, a cause, a career, a practice, or an understanding. This love is not some romantic myth of everyone embracing and singing the same song. Instead, it's a truly sensitive vulnerability to what is. Ideas only go so far. At some point, the heart may open to the totally indefinable, unpredictable, and often unwanted movement that life is. Love is that openness of heart. You could say that most of us attempt to refuse the gift of existence because there is a fear of the unexpected and the possibly painful. There is a great amount of tension in this refusal, and all it ever produces is a feeling of general upset. The attempt to refuse the river of life is futile. There is nothing separate from it that could ever refuse it. Question. People in spiritual circles often use the word liberation. In your experience, what gets liberated? Daryl, nothing because nothing has ever been in bondage. The entire story of a journey from ignorance to enlightenment is a fantasy. It doesn't matter what we think, none of the stories apply. Question, I know that a number of people have asked you to write down your own life story, but you won't do it. Why? Daryl, because it puts the focus back on delusions of thought. I'm inviting you to a freedom from that delusion. Why would I turn anyone back to the fantasies that create their mental anguish and conflict? Question, but if you gave your life story, people would see that your journey hasn't been easy, in the same way it hasn't been easy for them. Daryl, the bookshops are already filled with stories of difficult lives. I'm pointing to something else. Question, but many would like to hear your story. Daryl. Yes, but I'm pointing to a peace and well-being that reveals itself only when the focus on stories is dropped. In that, the illusions of your personal journey, conflict, and mental anguish may fade away. But, you'll never find out unless you step away from the stories. Question. Perhaps we could address another issue. You seem to have something against spiritual practices and I'd like to look at that. Daryl. I have nothing against them. But, in my experience a real sense of freedom and joy has nothing to do with practicing anything or developing anything. Somehow there's a general impression that this is about practicing awareness or concentration, trying to become more aware, more skilled at paying attention, clinging to a particular focus, clinging to the present, clinging to the breath clinging to physical sensations, clinging to concentration. Or there's the impression it's about developing another insight or endless kindness. The freedom I'm pointing to is not about developing awareness, concentration, insight, or anything else. It's not about practicing or developing anything. It's not about self-improvement. Don't you complain about things changing? But whether your relationship, your health, your job, your friends, your thoughts, and so on. Question. Yes, everyone does. Daryl, exactly. To some extent, most people already see the river. They're complaining because it's moving beyond control. They're already seeing the mysterious, unformed motion that life is. They've never experienced anything else. But... Most people refuse to acknowledge it to that degree. They prefer to cling to ideas of personal doing and control. Meditation simply lets the focus fall away from appearances of form and acknowledges constant motion. 
If you sit and do absolutely nothing for a period of time each day motion becomes obvious. Inside outside everywhere. That indefinable action is all that is. Question, but if I don't make an effort to do anything I could end up catatonic, sitting around all the time not responding to anything at all. Daryl, try it. Try not responding to anything at all. Try giving up everything that makes sense to you, everything you value, everything you care for. You may be able to restrain your urges temporarily, but they will eventually push through because, each time life offers a particular set of circumstances, it also offers your response to those circumstances, the response that makes most sense to you or feels right to you. Forever altering in some way, but in each instance, there is one response that ultimately pushes itself forward. Traumatic situations contain a storm of contradictory feelings and urges, and the opinions of others may be added to the mix, but out of that storm, one response will ultimately push through. If we attempt to repress that response, it produces conflict. If we attempt that kind of control, we'll eventually experience confusion, stomach aches, headaches, depression, and exhaustion and this emotional turmoil will eventually reveal our true feelings. This doesn't mean that we express every passing whim or emotion, but certain ones are more persistent than others and they become the expression of our lives. A moment of anger may not need to be expressed, but an ongoing feeling of anger or unhappiness will eventually make itself known. It's the same with all emotion. In each moment, your circumstances are given, and your response to circumstance is also given. This will be followed by other circumstances and responses. It's one seamless movement. It's a fascinating parade of appearances, and there's no way of knowing exactly what's coming next. This is a multi-dimensional entertainment system with the automatic appearance of sights, sounds, touches, tastes, smells, thoughts, urges, activities, adventures, traumas, confusion, clarity, joy, and sorrow. All of that. And more. Just do whatever makes the most sense to you in any particular moment. Everything you are comes together physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, a million nuances in alignment with a particular set of circumstances, because it's one movement. You're expressed in whatever way you're expressed. All of existence is this mysterious river of expression. Maybe you'll sit and do nothing, or maybe you'll go for a five-mile run, or maybe you'll try to end world hunger. Who knows? The river flows in whatever way it flows. It's filled with surprises. You don't have to make yourself obey the river of life. There's nothing but the river. There's never been anything else. The ego is a movement in that river. Sit down, do nothing, and Old Man River or Old Crone River just keeps rolling along. If this action reveals itself clearly then all personal doing and knowing comes to an absolute end. We're cast upon the waters of unform. In losing our life this way, Losing the false notions of being, owning, doing, and knowing, we find everything simply offered in a miraculous movement. It's acknowledged fully that there is only a great mysterious river. There will be no need of psychological protection or justification. There's no need to protect your image or justify your existence if there is only a mysterious motion expressing itself. The basic physical survival mechanisms still function, but there is no need of ego protection. Pride, rationalization, justification, clinging, greed, aggression, arrogance, self-pity and so on fade away. We normally compare ourselves to others thinking that we're either inadequate or superior. Usually it's a sense of inadequacy. We imagine countless situations that are better than ours and attempt to willfully impose them on the flow of life. But, 
that will only happen if that's what the river is offering, and there's no way of predicting exactly what the process will offer. Question, you're so certain of this. It makes sense to me, but I don't have that certainty. Daryl, as far as I can tell, you can't find this certainty in words. It's found only in acknowledging motion. This means stepping out of thoughts and willful actions to simply rest as the unprovoked happening of the moment. There is nothing to get, nothing to do, and nothing to understand. It's not about practicing something for an hour in order to be able to see motion for a few minutes. There's never anything but motion. Sit down and let it reveal itself. Maybe it's restless and irritated. Maybe it's calm. Maybe it's angry. Maybe it's peaceful. Maybe it's sad. Maybe it's happy. Maybe thoughts are coming by the millions. Maybe there are no thoughts. Whatever it is is changing and there's no way to stop it. It's happening on its own. Leave it alone and it reveals its own natural order. In no longer wrestling with it, no longer wanting it to be different, no longer trying to do it or direct it, no longer trying to understand it, there is a great sense of peace and the growing faith that you don't ever have to wrestle with it. Because it simply moves to its own rhythm and current. It always has. It's a miraculous expression and we're simply expressed. At first, we test this in a safe place, a quiet room, alone, or with those we can trust, but soon it's apparent in all activities. Everything is a mysterious process carrying itself along. If you want to learn about life then watch it flow, just as you would sit on a river bank watching the water flow by. The water of now is the shift and dance of sights, sounds, touches, tastes, smells, thoughts, moods, and so on. You may notice that the watcher is flowing as body sensations rise and pass, the breath comes and goes, and the heart beats. There is vibration, pulsation, waves of energy, heat, coolness, heaviness, lightness, a little pain here, a little shift there. You may further notice that the observing is flowing as attention dances around one moment with the breath, the next sound, the next sight, the next touch and so on. Sometimes clear and sometimes dull. Soon it's obvious there is only motion and it no longer makes sense to describe the ripples of the moment or get caught up in them. Ultimately, this river can't be understood. It's totally baffling. In absolute puzzlement, it's free of all ideas of awareness, pure awareness, observing self, world, doing, knowing and being. There's no attempt to do anything, know anything or be anything, and surprisingly life happens anyway. What's even more surprising is that nothing important is lost. Instead, things like fear, greed, condemnation, Anger, argument, doubt, alienation, and loneliness melt away. Old habits in these areas may still arise, but it becomes increasingly more difficult to sustain them. It's different for each person. Question, so others are experiencing this freedom. The people you teach? Daryl, yes. But, it's not a matter of teaching anyone how to be free. It depends on whether or not someone inherently resonates with the sense of life. For those who do, the self is immediately removed from the center of existence without any effort to do so. It's simply the realization that this old perspective is false. I can't create anyone's potential for relating to this. All I can do is point to a few observable facts. For some those facts are merely a curiosity they're not incredibly significant. For others, when they see what I'm pointing to, the sense of life shifts radically. From then on, their personal stories of confusion and angst start melting away automatically. Question, is this the freedom described in the teachings of Buddhism, Taoism, Advaita and some others? Daryl, 
It certainly seems so according to various accounts, but there are always those who would argue against that. For me this question isn't important. What's important is your experience of life right now. I'm asking if everything that you know of is constantly changing. I'm asking you if that's true. It's a very simple question. I'm also asking you if the changing is occurring on its own. If you sit down and make no effort to do anything or be anything, does life's movement still occur, including the process that you are? If the answer to these questions is yes, then it follows that existence, in all of your experience, is indefinable motion accomplishing itself. Is that your experience? If it is, you are immediately outside of everything that anyone has ever said. Every statement ever made about existence is ultimately unimportant. Including mine. Descriptions don't apply. What remains is wonder and amazement. It's the same sense of wonder you might experience under a huge, star-filled night sky. As you look up, the beauty and immensity of the happening is indescribable, thought is completely baffled, leaving only a sense of awe. It's possible to have that sense of wonder when you're washing the dishes, or looking in the bathroom mirror, or having a thought, because even the most ordinary moment is that same incomprehensible happening. Most of us focus on fantasies and believe they're true. The great and wondrous river of existence is ignored in a desperate clinging to conflict-ridden, ego-bound stories of form. If you ever acknowledge the river fully, even once, those delusions can't maintain themselves. Book 2 Essence Revisited Slipping Past the Shadows of Illusion by Daryl Bailey Chapter Introduction The ideas offered here are not the only possible views of existence. If you relate to them wonderful if not wonderful. Chapter Question and Answer Part 1 Question You describe the human race as being perfect as it is, as perfect as any other manifestation of nature. You also say we're not responsible for who we are or what we do. This is very different from other teachings, such as Buddhism, that promote practices for self-restraint, self-knowledge, self-improvement and so on. Daryl, it seems so at first. Students of spiritual teachings often believe those teachings are about perfecting themselves through great effort. They do various practices in the hope of turning themselves into something called an enlightened being. They assume an enlightened being is someone who never experiences unpleasant emotions like confusion, anger, sorrow, jealousy, fear, depression, and so on. Students are hoping to escape these difficulties and attempt to make themselves calm and contented all the time. They're looking for some kind of understanding and skill that will give them control over the unpleasant aspects of life. I meet them after they've been doing their self-development practices for many years and they're wondering why those practices haven't worked, why they don't feel perfected, and why they still experience unpleasant emotions. It's because the so-called enlightenment that these traditions offer has nothing to do with self-improvement or control. You can practice observing your thoughts and emotions, analyzing them, restraining them, and attempting to overcome them as much as you want, but there's a basic delusion in that situation that never gets addressed, and that delusion is what these teachings are ultimately about. All the great spiritual teachings ultimately point to a freedom that has nothing to do with self-improvement or control. Question, and that freedom is... Daryl, the realization that life isn't our doing, we're a movement of nature. Everything just as it is in any moment, is the already complete and pure expression of existence, it's never been a person accomplishing anything. Question, could you elaborate on that? Daryl, yes. If we examine life, we can observe that everything is changing. 
even the most stable looking thing in existence is undergoing some change in each moment. This is easy to see in things that change quickly, such as thoughts, moods and emotions, but it's not so immediately obvious in things that change slowly, such as walls, furniture and mountains. However, if we take the time to seriously consider it, we can acknowledge the fact that everything is changing. If it isn't maintained, this house we're sitting in will eventually dry up, turn to dust and blow away. Nobody has the impression that it will stay brand new for hundreds of years and then grow old overnight. Instead, there is the sense that it's aging slowly and that it's changing right now, in subtle ways. If we look at trees that have fallen in a forest, it's easy to observe that they're decomposing. They're slowly vanishing, turning to powder, and those bits of powder will eventually become so small they'll seem to disappear. The form of a tree is actually a movement that unfolds from a seed, grows to maturity, and eventually fades away. It's the same with everything in existence. The Himalayan mountains are growing one inch every year while other mountain ranges are grinding down and will eventually be flat land. There once was an ocean in this place where we're sitting, but it's not here now, and what is is changing in its own ways. The planet Earth began as hot gases that became molten lava and then solid rock, and this rock will move through its various appearances until it eventually disappears. Astronomers watch entire galaxies blipping out of existence in the far reaches of the universe. If we explore life with its plants growing, creatures aging, rivers flowing, cities transforming, climates fluctuating, continents shifting and so on, we find constant movement. If we look to our own being, we find the same happening. Breath coming and going, heart beating, thoughts flowing moods shifting, perceptions altering, sounds dancing, twinges, pains, pulsations, vibrations, and so on. All of existence is a moving, vibrant event. It doesn't matter what it is, an atom, a thought, a sound, a situation, a body, a mental state, a plant, a storm, a mountain, or a galaxy, everything that we know of is changing either quickly or slowly. Inward and outward, big or small, there is only this shift and flux. If this is fully acknowledged, it may be realized that this is all that actually exists. No object or thing is ever truly formed anywhere. Nothing is ever established or defined. No thing ever comes to stay to exist to be. What we usually consider to be a collection of things, the many things of the universe, is more accurately pointed to as a great spirit since this reflects the fact that it is a vital flowing event. In some spiritual traditions it's referred to as an unformed presence or simply unform since constant change is the ongoing absence of any particular arrangement or shape. This constant flow isn't some imaginary situation. It's all that is ever experienced. It's everything we are and everything around us. Inward and outward, there is only an unformed liveliness. Some call it energy, quantum energy or dark energy. Some call it pure consciousness or pure awareness. Some call it mind with a capital M. Some refer to it as the ever-shifting ocean of existence. And some simply give it labels like God, Tao or Atman. Obviously, a happening or presence that always changes can't be described as anything in particular. It's an ever-shifting dynamic. Completely acknowledging this vital event brings a major shift in the sense of living. Existence is seen as a collection of things, there is the hope of finding and holding something that won't change. There's also the belief that existence can be described and understood. But, this perspective brings a great deal of unhappiness because it constantly refuses the dance that life is. We want life to be something in particular, something pleasant, something definable, something stable and secure, 
a particular way of being. But existence isn't anything in particular. There's only an ever-shifting event, the absence of any intrinsic form. The belief in form constantly struggles with the movement of existence, and that movement will always break through any false impression of stability, leaving feelings of frustration, confusion and sorrow. If, however, it's realized that every so-called thing including you is actually motion, there is no expectation of stability. There's never any form to hold or to understand. There is simply a magical dance of ever-changing appearances. If we ask the body to stop growing old, it does not. If we ask it to change only in healthy directions, it does not. Even with our best efforts, the body will at some point exhibit sickness, aging, and death. Ask your circumstances to stop changing or to change only in pleasant directions and they don't. The same is true for your various thoughts, feelings, perceptions, mental activities, states of mind and all other apparent things. Waves rise up and fade away. The breath inhales and exhales. The heart clenches and relaxes. There is the alternating appearance of sound, silence, light, dark, hot, cold, joy, sorrow, clarity, confusion, the pleasant and the unpleasant. Whether it's the change of moods, viewpoints, bodies, the weather, the environment, and so on, life is an ever-shifting flow. No one is making this happen and no one can stop it. We can try to stop it, to control thoughts, emotions, health and so on, only to discover that the effects of such efforts are both limited and short-lived. No matter how much you've tried to make your life constantly pleasant, it hasn't worked. For everyone, life is an ongoing dance of ups and downs. Realizing this allows us to see that, along with pleasant periods, there will be unpleasant periods. Difficulties arise, sometimes extreme, because this is the natural rhythm of existence expressing itself. On one hand, this is a wonderful fact to learn. It dissolves a great deal of useless struggle and confusion when we simply acknowledge this obvious rhythm. However, most of us are then left with the feeling of being someone subject to the cold, cruel whims of existence, someone standing separate from the event, being abused by it. So let's look at this more closely. If you sit or lie down and make no effort at all, you may discover another fact. Everything happens on its own. Breathing occurs without anyone doing it. The heart beats in the same way. Thing occurs without anyone having to manipulate the rods and cones of the eye. Hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, and thinking simply happen. Feelings, thoughts, and moods come and go. Focuses of attention dance around, blood circulates, hair grows, the nervous system operates, and so on. All of this simply happens. There isn't anyone doing it. As a fertilized egg in the womb, we didn't decide to grow larger or decide to take a trip down the birth canal. Outside the womb, we didn't decide to begin growing, thinking, walking, or talking. No self directs any of this. It simply occurs as the compulsive flow of nature. We don't create our bodies and we don't create our brains. We don't create the physical abilities, mental abilities, and lack of abilities we are. We don't create the apparent needs, interests, and concerns that arise in any moment. All of this simply happens on its own. We can't arbitrarily decide to be something else, to be a different body and brain, a different set of physical and mental abilities, different needs, interests, and concerns. Even if it appears as though we make decisions, they grow out of the needs, interests, and concerns that arise in any particular moment and there's no self that makes it happen. Nature presents situations that demand a decision and the response to those situations is a movement of the only body, need, interest, and ability that nature also presents. 
We don't have this body need interest and ability, we are this body need interest and ability. Again, if you sit and make no effort, the movement that you are expresses itself quite clearly, the dance of pulsations, vibrations, thoughts, moods, needs, interests, and so on, but there's never an experience of anything owning that movement. Some incline toward art, some to science, others to social service, to family, to business, religion, technology, and so on. If your main love is art, you can't arbitrarily decide to love science instead. Everyone's experience indicates that everything we are and everything we do is simply the movement of existence itself. It's here that we come to the highest realization indicated in all the great spiritual traditions. We do not exist as anything apart from the flow of nature, and that flow is an unformed, inexplicable dance accomplishing itself. Question. You're saying we have no free will. Daryl, no I'm saying be very careful with descriptions of existence. They contain a great deal of confusion and fear. If everything is acknowledged as it actually is, ever shifting and unformed, it's an indefinable happening. All that's ever experienced is an unformed dance presenting itself. It's the vibrant, pulsing, luminous event that this moment is. There is only that. Question, but surely that can't be the case. I mean, I've decided to come here and ask these questions, and you've decided to answer them the way you do. That's free will. Daryl, yes, but the decision you apparently made grows out of an interest in spiritual inquiry, out of the apparent interest, understanding, and need that you are right now. You didn't decide at some point in your life to be this interest, understanding, and need. It simply happens as a movement of nature. Someone else is out surfing or studying international banking while you're here asking me these questions. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to be the expression you are in this moment. I also have an interest in spiritual inquiry, an interest I didn't create and can't ignore. If you come to me seriously investigating this matter, I'm compelled to respond to your questions. I don't decide what my response will be. I'm capable of responding in only one way, and that response is what nature presents in this moment. I can't arbitrarily choose to be something else. Question, so for you it's automatic, everything happens automatically. Daryl, yes. You could also say spontaneously, organically. Just as the ripples, bubbles, and waves of an ocean are not separate objects directing their lives, their one movement, the various things in the universe are not separate objects directing their lives. They're also one movement. All forms are motion. Form or thingness is an illusion, and there's no cure for that illusion other than seeing that it's unreal. Just as a rope, if it's not seen clearly, can seem to be a snake or a mirage can seem to be water, the totally unformed, inexplicable dance of this moment can seem to be people in a world. But, that's a false appearance. Question, and you're saying this is enlightenment. Daryl, yes, realizing this is called enlightenment, but it's the realization of a happening that can't be defined in any way at all. This happening can have no true description, not even the description of a person getting enlightened. There's simply the unformed, luminous, pulsing dance that this moment is. It magically appears to be all kinds of things, but those appearances are false. None of them are a stable form. There is only constant movement, and there's no possible explanation for it. Question. It's a pure knowing. Daryl, no, that's another fantasy. Question, but what's knowing that? Daryl, nothing. Knowing is a meaningless label. Consider this, with a newborn, there are no labels for existence, there is no storyline, no knower, no knowing, and no object of knowing. 
is the same basic warming, cooling, sounding, silencing, lightning, darkening, tingling, trembling event that this moment is, but there are no labels for it. It's a totally mysterious happening. If I point to something nearby, this for example, and I ask you what this is, you would give me a sound, the sound chair, but that sound is not what I'm pointing to. If I ask a newborn what this is, the child isn't going to say chair. The child doesn't have a sound or symbol for anything. There's simply a mysterious happening without labels. For the so-called child there isn't even a question, it's just meaningless blah blah blah. At some point labels will arise as part of this happening, but sounds like chair and knowing and child have no more meaning than sounds like disladonk and wataferu. Existence is a totally mysterious event in its arising, and no matter how many sounds and labels appear in this happening, it remains a totally mysterious event. Just as the barking of a trained seal is not explaining existence, no matter how many sounds we're trained to bark, we're also not explaining existence. Question, so how is this felt to be freedom? Daryl, in any moment, there is only an unformed, inexplicable happening moving on its own, but there's the strange belief that it's a self, living in, and knowing, a world of things. It's an absolutely mysterious event, however. There's the apparent delusion that it's being understood and the further delusion that there's something intrinsically wrong with it. There's a desperate attachment to the story of a me that is knowing and directing something called life, and the feeling that I'm not doing it correctly, because it's never what it should be. There's a general feeling of guilt for our perceived flaws and shortcomings, and the judging of everyone else as being even more flawed, in order to feel better about the situation. As a result there's an aching urge to correct ourselves and everything else, and a huge amount of frustration and sorrow at the fact that it never seems to get corrected. But, all of this is an extraordinary fantasy. Existence as it's experienced, is a totally inexplicable happening presenting itself. There can't be anything wrong with it. Realizing this brings an incredible sense of relief and rest. Question, nothing wrong? All over the world we have starvation, wars, brutalities. How can you say there's nothing wrong? Daryl, these are the natural expressions of existence. Look at any forest environment or ocean environment and you'll find the same apparent hardship and cruelty. The difficulty with this is the strange assumption that we somehow exist outside the movement of nature and that we're in charge of it. The idea that we're in charge of existence is a delusion. Everything we are is an expression of nature. We're not holding existence together with our efforts. Our efforts themselves are the movement of nature. We obviously don't create our physical and mental abilities, our bodies, needs, interests, urges, understandings and concerns, therefore, we don't create our actions or anything else. Question, that doesn't seem very liberating to discover I'm a total slave. Daryl, that's not what I'm saying. There is no you that stands separate from existence. You're not being pushed around by it. Everything you appear to be, and all that you appear to do, is not a definable you at all. It's the unformed, inexplicable dance of the universe. You're expressed in the same way the stars in the night sky are expressed, or any other appearance of nature is expressed. How can there be anything wrong with you? Which snowflake is doing it wrong? Which squirrel is making a mistake in its squirreling? What storm is making a bad life decision? In any moment, everything is the only possible expression it can be. Think this doesn't make everything pain free or flow in a pleasant way. It simply acknowledges that in any moment life is whatever it is, and it's not personal. 
Einstein pointed out that we're part of the movement of existence and are no more responsible for our actions than an inanimate object, such as a stone, is responsible for its behavior. The Upanishads declare that when everything is seen to be a movement of the Lord, the Big Self, the great dance of existence, you are liberated. There is no you apart from the dance. The Buddha declared what is is unformed, descriptions don't apply, and realizing this puts an end to any belief in stories of me and mine, my existence, my doing. The Bible has God, the Great Spirit, declaring, I am the I am the basic happening, the emness, the isness. I create light, darkness, peace, and evil, I do all of it. In all cases, there's an indefinable event or presence appearing to be many things, but those appearances are false. The stories of you and me of various forms of one thing influencing another and so on are a fantasy. Question, but if you convince us that we're not responsible for our actions it could lead to chaos. Without a sense of responsibility, we could do terrible things or give up doing altogether. Daryl, when the mind first hears these ideas, it may attempt to reject them out of an irrational fear. It throws forth many objections, such as the ones you just mentioned. Or it will worry about being a mindless robot. If we're functioning to the laws of nature, doesn't that mean we're merely robots? It brings fears of determinism and fatalism. There's the fantasy that we'll be trapped in some fixed mechanical way of behaving with no hope of improving our situation, and we'll eventually sit around thinking, what's the use in doing anything? This is the power of illusion, the irrational fear of an ego losing control, when all the while there hasn't been an ego in control. Acknowledging the vibrant flow of existence doesn't lead to some apathetic feeling of futility. Instead, it gives rise to the wonder and amazement of a magical presentation. Seeing that we're the dance of the cosmos doesn't allow disorder, nor does it make us irresponsible. Even if a planet could know that it's an expression of the universe, it wouldn't be able to leave its orbit, the orbit is part of the expression. It's the same with us. A sense of responsibility isn't your creation, it's an expression of nature. Love isn't your creation, it's also an expression of nature. Thinking isn't your creation. If existence didn't present it, it wouldn't exist. Try giving up all that makes sense to you and all that you value. Try giving up the needs, interests and concerns that you are in this moment. You can't do it because you don't exist as anything apart from what's being presented. Try doing nothing at all, just try it and you'll eventually do something. You need to eat, sleep, go to the toilet, make a living, associate with friends. Everything you are is this compulsory movement. Even the urge to sit and rest is a spontaneous, compulsory action. Whether you appear to be the boss of a big corporation, or a nun meditating in a cave, or anything else for that matter, isn't very important, because all of it is a totally inexplicable event accomplishing itself. If you aren't already doing terrible things, realizing this isn't going to leave you with a new tendency to do them. Your so-called personality isn't your creation. Some people do terrible things, but on any given day most do not. The human race didn't decide it would be this way, it simply is this way. This isn't some robotic existence. You're not being pushed around or programmed by something else. There is only the wild fullness of existence freely expressing itself. You don't exist as anything apart from that fullness. In its illusions of form, this happening is endlessly creative. No two appearances of form are ever the same. Each and every instant is unique. No two identical things have ever been found. No two snowflakes, no two leaves, no two trees, no two moments. This shifting, vibrant event is ultimately unpredictable because it never repeats itself exactly. 
Some general predictions can be made, but the particulars are always a surprise. Even the generalities can be totally unexpected, just look at weather predictions. Question, so life is moving out of control. Daryl, ideas of control don't apply to this, there is only movement. This flow has an inherent order or current. Some call it an innate intelligence. A plant grows to that order. It twists this way and that, but eventually presents itself as a recognizable plant, even though it's never identical to any other. The plant doesn't need control, it isn't consciously deciding to express itself this way. It doesn't hold itself together with efforts, nor does it decide the direction of its movement. No one has the impression that a plant is in charge of its growing, it's a movement of nature. Why would you think it's different for us? Question, how did your sense of this occur? Daryl, it's just happening. I could tell you a life story describing certain key moments, but all of that would be a fantasy, existence has no form or explanation. Question, but you have thoughts and stories. Daryl, no, not exactly, the movement that we call thoughts and stories is still happening, but it's a totally indefinable event that simply presents itself. As an infant, there is no understanding of anything, existence is an inexplicable buzz and tingle. It still is. It doesn't matter how many forms seem to exist or how many apparent sounds arise and fade, all of it is an inexplicable, unformed dance presenting itself. Question, that doesn't help me understand this. Daryl, there is no understanding. Question, but can't you say more about this process of awakening? Daryl, yes, if you want me to. Question, how did this happen to you? Daryl, it seemed to occur over a lifetime, with particular realizations coming in particular moments. From an early age onward, there were periods when everything felt like one big happening. In my apparent twenties, I had difficulty understanding how anyone could be making decisions, since those decisions automatically arise from interests and abilities that none of us create. Years later, I read a book stating that no one has ever had any experience of directing life. As I considered that statement, it was obviously true. The happenings that we call bodies, needs, interests, urges and actions simply happen as a movement of nature. At first, there was fear and confusion around all of this because it seemed as though I was losing control. The storyline about me being in control was threatened, but as it became even more obvious that everything was happening on its own, the fear and confusion dissipated. At a further point, it became obvious that existence is absolutely indefinable. Identifying forms doesn't explain anything because existence has no form, everything is changing. Who is describing form can't possibly be the truth. Even stories about me growing up reading a book and having realizations can't be true. There's such a fascination with the appearance of existence, an attachment to how it looks, feels and sounds, but existence has no particular look, feel or sound. Whatever it appears to be now is already on its way to some other appearance. Feelings are changing, moods are changing, thoughts are changing, sights are changing, sounds are changing, Bodies are changing, activities are changing, cities, countries, planets, galaxies, all of this is happening on its own. It's an inexplicable, vibrant dance without form. No one is making it happen, and no one can stop it. Question, what about spiritual practices for awakening? Daryl, most so-called spiritual practices are the attempt to develop and control something. They're based on the fantasy that you're in charge of existence. Those practices can't move beyond the story that you're in control, because they're the story that you're in control, the belief that you're going to make something happen by practicing. 
Moving beyond this belief can only occur by realizing what's actually happening, by realizing there is only an indefinable, vibrant event accomplishing itself. If you sit down and make no effort to do anything at all, the basic nature of life expresses itself clearly. This is the most profound meditation of any spiritual tradition. Some say it's a practice, but many would argue that it's not a practice, because you're not doing anything. In the Advaita community it's known as satsang, it means association with being. This doesn't mean we always have to sit around doing nothing, but it's only when we're obviously doing nothing that it becomes obvious everything is presenting itself. All the great spiritual teachings ultimately point to this, no matter what else they seem to offer. Whether it's called meditation, satsang, non-doing, bare awareness, silent prayer, faith, the corpse pose, just sitting, resting with the moment, and so on, isn't important. In all cases, you're invited to make no effort at all, and life may reveal itself to be the magical event that it actually is. The belief in form and personal doing may fade away, and the vibrant, indefinable happening that everything is becomes obvious. In certain traditions, they say there is only God or Atman, but these are simply labels for the inexplicable liveliness that existence is. Call it whatever you have to, that's part of the dance. There are teachings that say it will take 30 years of effort to realize this and others that invite you to it immediately, but they all have this in common. Whether it seems to occur after 30 years of effort, or seems to occur while hearing someone talk about it, or seems to occur by sheer accident, doesn't really matter. In all cases, it's the realization that everything is unformed, indefinable and simply presenting itself. If this realization occurs, all the descriptions and storylines are realized to be false. Thirty years of effort will be seen as fantasy. Stages of development will be seen as fantasy. Enlightenment will be seen as fantasy. These descriptions are false. There has never been anyone doing anything or arriving anywhere. In any so-called moment, there is only a totally unformed, inexplicable happening. However, the illusion of an ego directing its life is so widespread that the urge to control is found almost everywhere. Even in spiritual circles, there's a general assumption that the teaching must be about controlling something. There's usually an attempt to control and create perfect health, perfect calm, perfect love, perfect concentration, perfect understanding, and so on, according to some idealized fantasy. But, this misses the essential point. Question, which is? Daryl, realization. As Alan Watts used to say, it's not true that you came into this world, you came out of it like a flower comes out of a plant. You're something the whole universe is doing. Question, but you've been meditating since you were 14 years old. Truly that effort has created the understanding you have now. Daryl, with all due respect, that statement doesn't make any sense. When you say one thing causes another, you're actually saying there is only the movement of the universe. That's what the story of cause and effect ultimately states. If we say meditating caused this understanding, it then has to be asked, what caused the meditating? We might say that it was based on the personality, ability and need that I am. But what caused those things? We could say my genetic makeup had something to do with it as well as my upbringing. But what was the cause of those things? We then have to consider my parents, their genetics, their upbringing, my grandparents, great-grandparents and so on, back through the entire history of the human race. However, everything that occurs in the cosmos supports the human race, so we have to look at that causal chain as well. Human beings exist on this planet with the help of oxygen, moisture, warmth and light. 
Those conditions exist because of the movement of the galaxy, and the galaxy exists because the entire universe arranges itself as it does. By acknowledging the entire movement of cause and effect, we come to the full happening of the universe and then run out of causes, because nothing else is evident. If you really believe in the chain of cause and effect, you can't possibly believe there's a separate self accomplishing anything. Every atom of your being, everything you appear to think, say and do, is an expression of the chain. Question. The point I wanted to make is that people do spiritual practices and get enlightened. Daryl, yes apparently so, but obviously this has nothing to do with the practices, since out of the hundreds of thousands of people apparently doing them, over the centuries, only a relatively small number have awakened. Added to this is the fact that people who don't do spiritual practices also awaken. Einstein was a good example, Spinoza was another. They merely acknowledged their scientific observations. I've heard of someone who was simply walking cattle back to a barn when he realized everything is the movement of nature. Another was having sex in a brothel. Another was sick and spitting up blood when this realization spontaneously occurred. A young girl in Japan was dying and realized the mysterious movement that everything is. A boy in India simply stopped feeling that he was a particular person and from that moment on acknowledged the totally inexplicable event of existence. Buddhist scriptures record that many people awoke while simply listening to the Buddhist talks. Advaita traditions are filled with similar stories involving other teachers. This so-called enlightenment has presented itself in almost every situation you can imagine, yet there's no particular approach, no method, and no technique that is guaranteed to make it happen. I'm not saying don't do spiritual practices, and I'm not saying do them. I'm saying you don't have to concern yourself with that, because everything is a movement of nature. That includes the way you live, as well as any so-called awakening. All that anyone can ever do is be the body, need, interest, urge, and action that nature is presenting in any particular moment. Question, can anyone be enlightened? Daryl, actually no one can be enlightened. The so-called awakening is the realization that everything is absolutely indefinable, even the description of someone getting enlightened can't be true. Fixating on stories of enlightenment misses the miracle of life's full event. If we walk into a forest, we marvel at the range and texture of nature's appearance. Each aspect of it is a wondrous expression of the universe, each tree, flower, blade of grass, bird, and butterfly. We don't feel any of it is a mistake. We don't run up to the gnarled trees and tell them they should be like the tall, straight trees. We don't tell them that they're not trying hard enough, or they're not good enough, or they're not practicing enough. We don't tell them they've gone in the wrong direction, or that they should be something else. That would be ridiculous. Instead, there's an appreciation of nature's manifestations, a wonder and delight. There's the feeling that each apparent thing is a movement of the whole and each is playing its part in the great event we call existence. But, Go to the supermarket and see how much wonder and delight you find in the line of people at the checkout stand. In that situation, are we marveling at the wondrous expressions of nature, or do we endlessly criticize nature's creation? Look at him behaving that way, what an idiot! And look at her, she shouldn't be dressed like that, she's too old. We do the same at home, staring into the bathroom mirror, thinking, what's wrong with me? I shouldn't be like this. I should be something else or something more. Maybe we wish we were enlightened or that everyone was enlightened, thinking it would make everything so much better. But, the enlightenment mentioned in the great spiritual traditions isn't a movement to a better existence. Instead, it's the realization that everything has to be exactly whatever it is in any particular moment. 
All of it is the already complete and pure expression of the cosmos. Question, so enlightenment can't save the world? Daryl, save it from what? Every apparent thing is moving to its essential nature. No aspect of existence is doing it wrong, any more than any raindrop is doing it wrong. Just because it often seems unpleasant doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. Existence is doing fine, in fact, it's doing us. Realizing this dissolves the self-righteous arrogance we usually exhibit. No one can take credit or blame for their behavior. No one can give credit or blame to another. Everything has to function in the way it functions. You have to be the body need interest urge and action that presents itself in this moment and whatever it appears to be now is already on its way to some other expression. It's a fantasy to think that your personal effort is responsible for what you are. There is no personal effort, nature gives rise to all apparent abilities, interests and actions. To think there's a you that deserves the credit or blame is like thinking a flower deserves the credit or blame for the way it looks and behaves. You can't make a mistake in living life, because whatever you appear to think say and do is simply the inexplicable dance of existence. Question, but we should consider life carefully before making decisions. Daryl, logical thinkers think so. Intuitives do not. Question, your point is. Daryl, no two expressions are ever the same. We can't become a copy of someone else. As it states in the old children's story, a swan will feel ugly and out of place if it's trying to be a duck. It's also true that a duck will have difficulty in trying to be a swan. Spiritual teachings encourage an appreciation of the amazingly unique and wondrous expression that each of us is. We're not trying to make ducks into swans. There's nothing wrong with ducks. There's nothing wrong with anything. Question, so if a poisonous snake tries to bite me I shouldn't do anything because that's the natural expression of existence and there's nothing wrong with it. Daryl, that's not what I said. Even though there's nothing wrong in their expression, certain snakes and certain people are naturally considered to be dangerous and we respond to danger automatically. Nature is automatically expressing all apparent circumstances and all apparent responses to circumstance. It's one movement. Even if you try to suppress your natural responses, they'll eventually break through because we don't exist as anything apart from that. Question, okay, but after hearing all of this, I'm still puzzled as to how I'm supposed to live life. Daryl, yes most of us want someone to tell us how to live, but no one can tell us what we're supposed to be or do. Each of us is a unique expression. People go to spiritual teachers hoping to find something to make their lives constantly pleasant. They want control. They ask all kinds of questions, but it's really one basic question, how can I get enough understanding and control so that I never feel confused, frightened, sad, uncomfortable and so on? The answer to this is you can't. The great spiritual teachings don't offer an escape from life's expressions. They offer the possibility of dispelling certain confusions, but not by gaining control over them. It's by acknowledging certain facts, such as the fact that every apparent thing is changing. By acknowledging the actual happening of the moment, unrealistic ideas and expectations may fade away, along with the misery that accompanies them. The mistaken belief in ideas of form and personal doing may end, along with the confusions, anxieties, and frustrations that belief contains. Life has an inherent sense of well-being, a natural richness and fullness. As a child, you didn't have to try to make yourself happy. Life was a magical event, even though it was sometimes difficult and unpleasant. The focus was on the fullness of the event, and not strongly attached to ideas of form and control. 
Spiritual teachings are an invitation to once again acknowledge the great, unformed, vibrant event that life actually is, along with its inherent sense of magic and well-being. You may appear to explore many teachings, both Eastern and Western, but your particular way of living will be unique. Just like any other expression of nature, you can never match another exactly. You don't need to figure out what to do next, you don't have to worry about getting it right or wrong. The next priority, the next need, interest, and concern that you are rises up on its own, it always has. As an apparent four-year-old it was what it was, at ten, it was different, as a teenager, it was something else. In this moment, it's whatever it is, and it's automatically on its way to some other expression. At times, it may seem vague and uncertain, but that's also the natural expression of existence. There's no particular you to be found. There's simply the body need interest, urge, and action that nature is presenting in this moment and it's already on its way to something else. Before lunch it was someone needing lunch, after lunch it's different. Before bed it's someone needing sleep, in the morning it's different. Maybe there's some major issue presenting itself, and the responses to that issue are also presenting themselves. This may dance around in various ways for an apparently long period of time, but it will eventually move on to some radically different expression. There's only this unformed dance. In realizing this, there's a growing trust in being the movement we are, a sense of wonder at the magical appearance of everything, and a sense of richness in the full and vital expression of the moment. There's also a tremendous sense of rest, because we don't have to hold ourselves together. Everything we appear to think, say, and do in any particular moment is automatically presenting itself. As Jiju Krishnamurti used to say, perfection is this movement. We never seem to learn about this, that it is one movement. Question. Are you trying to get everyone to understand this? Daryl, not at all. Only a certain percentage of the human population will have an interest in this. Others are expressed differently. There's nothing anyone can do about that because there isn't anyone doing anything. There never has been. Chapter Reflections 1 the perspective presented here is not the only possible view of existence and it's important only to those who relate to it. It has no importance outside of that. Coming together of people around a certain perspective has no more significance or meaning than robins gathering with robins and crows with crows. Like clouds gathering in the sky, it's the inexplicable play of existence doing what it does. It's difficult for most people to consider that someone like Hitler is a perfectly natural expression of existence. We accept the fact that sharks and tigers don't normally attack people, but some do. They're not the norm, but they are a harsh fact of life. Yet we find it so difficult to acknowledge that human beings are also expressed in this way. Saints and sinners are both valid expressions of existence, just as kittens and scorpions are. It's a misconceived arrogance that condemns one over the other, both must be whatever they are. One may appear gentle and passive, while the other is nasty and aggressive, in this they're different. But, each is simply an indefinable expression of existence, in this they're equal. This would be a doctrine of determinism if we existed as something separate from the movement of the universe, something being pushed around by it. But, we're not separate from it, we are this movement. This is what's meant when a tradition speaks of reaching the unconditioned. Life's mysterious event is not conditioned by anything, because it's an inexplicable, formless dynamic that is freely expressing itself. Nothing else is evident. What is usually believed to be our conditioned personal behavior is actually the inexplicable wholeness of existence freely expressing itself. Realizing this is what's meant by reaching the unconditioned. 
The ideas offered here may seem strange, but others who have expressed a similar view include Albert Einstein, Simone Weil, Nietzsche, Spinoza, Emerson, Thoreau, Goethe, Hafiz, Schopenhauer, Martin Luther, Teresa of Avila, Juliana of Norwich, St. Augustine, Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, Alan Watts, Immanuel Kant, Voltaire, David Bohm, the Zen Masters, Sufi Masters, Advaita Sages, and the Enlightened Teachers of the Upanishads. People want to awaken in order to make their worldly lives easier. What's revealed is that nothing needs transforming. Every apparent thing in any apparent moment is already flowing to its true nature. Any attempt to conform to some generalized standard of behavior is suffering. Having general standards for human beings creates conflict with the fact that nature constantly gives rise to unique expressions that will never match another exactly. To attempt to deny the unique manifestation you are is to suffer. You must be whatever you are in any apparent moment, and no matter what it appears to be now, it's unavoidably on its way to some other expression. The mental agonies of life are wrapped around the idea that we're something separate from the movement of existence, a me owning and directing the thoughts, feelings, interests, urges, and actions. The karmic chain of personal responsibility is based on this concept and carries with it the burden of guilt or the pride of accomplishment. Realizing we're a movement of the larger happening of existence removes us from the karmic wheel of personal responsibility. It's possible, for those who are interested, to realize we're a movement of existence itself, the same movement that appears as the stars in the night sky or the migration flights of wild birds. We now appear as we do, but we can just as easily appear to be a pinch of dust or a drop of moisture, and we will at some point, we're a happening without any particular form. Spiritual awakening is the opening to what actually is, the mystery of it, appearing to be this or that, always moving, shifting, never being anything in particular. Freedom is being this indefinable vitality, without the strain or effort of needing to be more than that. This doesn't end the pains and difficulties of life, it simply ends the delusion that any of this is being understood or directed. The various forms appearing in life can't be the reality, because all of them are changing. They're nothing more than false appearances. If we watch a cloud and it takes on the shape of a person, a house or a mountain, it doesn't matter what it looks like, we always know it's a cloud. The appearance of form is not the reality, the unformed cloud is. The same is true of everything, bodies, objects, sensations, moods, thoughts, activities, states of mind, relationships, and so on. All apparent things are changing, flowing. They're the passing appearances of a great unformed and inexplicable happening, a giant cloud, an event, a presence, call it whatever you have to. In the same way the appearances of a cloud move to its nature, all appearances move to the nature of existence. We mistake this inexplicable, unformed flow as a collection of things and its impersonal dance as a human accomplishment. Spiritual awakening can't build an ideal society because it's the realization that nothing we do is autonomous, our apparent personal actions are the impersonal movement of existence. Everything, just as it is in any apparent moment, is the already complete and pure expression of nature. Everything we've apparently done or doing now and will ever do is a movement of the cosmos. We are that inexplicable happening spontaneously expressing itself. To realize this is the freedom the great spiritual teachings point to. It's not the freedom to make ourselves and the world match some fantasy of perfection. There is this odd notion of nature versus nurture, as though the movement of existence is somehow divided into different parts that influence each other. Many of us wonder how much of what we are is our natural expression, and how much has been conditioned, 
and distorted by bad parenting or societal education. We seldom consider that bad parenting and the workings of society are also the natural expressions of existence. A parent's abilities or lack of abilities are just as much an expression of nature as anything else. The same is true of each and every apparent person and action in society. There is no nature versus nurture. Just as the apparently separate forms of an ocean, the tides, currents, bubbles, ripples and waves are actually one movement, so is every apparent thing in existence. Life isn't moving in any particular direction. Always here and now, it's simply without form, never becoming anything other than what it already is, unformed. Ideas of evolution, direction and progress are fantasies. Stories of evolution, direction and progress apply to the passing appearances of form, but form is a mirage. Any identifiable form or thing that appears to be existing now is always changing in some way and will disappear at some point. There is only inexplicable unform, it's not becoming something else. Ask three friends to sit around a table with you. Place a cup and a glass on the table. Put the cup closest to you and put the glass on the other side of the cup. Now say to your friends that you're going to tell them the truth of what's happening on the table, the cup is in front of the glass. Wrong, says the friend across from you. The glass eye is in front of the cup. Wrong, says the friend to your right. The cup is to the left of the glass. Wrong, says the friend to your left. The cup is to teach you right of the glass. You're all wrong. Life is a many-sided event that can't truly be described because descriptions are always one-sided. Added to this is the fact that there is ultimately no form to describe. Everything is changing. The essential nature of all things is to remain unformed. Even the sense of existing disappears every night and then apparently reappears. Descriptions of form are ultimately false. The happening of existence can't be explained in any true way. Realizing this is not another thought, it's the fading of attachment to thought, the end of belief in description. In its illusions of form, existence manifests in unique ways at all times. You can't find two identical things, no two snowflakes, no two trees, no two leaves, no two beings. No two people exhibit the same sensibility. Each may consider the fact that climbing Mount Everest brings a strong possibility of death, and while that frightens one, another finds it exciting and challenging. My manifestation can't be yours. You must manifest in whatever way life manifests you, you're a unique expression of nature. There's no place for you to get to other than your particular expression and in each apparent moment you're already that. I can only respect and encourage your manifestation. No one can ever say what it actually is and no one can tell you what it should be. Say that one person is doing it right and another is doing it wrong is like saying one snowflake is doing it right while another is doing it wrong. It makes no sense. Chapter Taoist Echoes Seen from the essential fact of change, all things melt into one seamless flow. An unformed presence, it's nothing in particular. All appearances are portions of this, they are expressions of its energy, its nature. The only effective remedy for suffering is in acknowledging the unformed nature of all things. Happiness and sadness come and go regardless of our wishes. We can't hold to one and avoid the other. Now brave, now fearful, now clear, now confused, now happy, now sad, never tied to one road. The way of life is ingrained, it's not a path to be pointed to, it's not something from which you can deviate. You don't consciously digest the food you eat or make the breath arise and pass. 
You don't make your blood flow, choose your interests, or create your understandings. Events happen by themselves. Chapter Reflections 2 We automatically respond correctly to any situation, since we're capable of responding in only one way, with whatever response nature presents in that moment. There is only what pushes itself to the front in any apparent instant, and all of it is an inexplicable happening. This realization is not the liberation that most spiritual practitioners are hoping for. They want a story of enlightened beings, and the story of a world moving to a golden age. They want a special self and a special world, instead of awakening from the dream of self and world. You don't have to learn to let life flow, there is only flow. You don't exist as anything apart from that. Matter appears to become energy, energy appears to become matter, liquid appears to become gas, gas appears to become liquid, heat appears to become coolness, coolness appears to become heat, and so on. More precisely, there is no thing called matter becoming some other thing called energy, any more than there's something called spring becoming some other thing called summer. These are merely the passing appearances of a pulsing, surging unform. It's like a cloud, one moment it looks like a person, and in another, it looks like a house. The cloud simply changes appearance, never becoming anything more than a cloud. All of existence is the same movement appearing to be various things, but never being anything more than a happening without form. What's here is here, but what it appears to be is not what it is. The appearances are constantly altering. This includes all that you appear to be and all that you appear to think, say, and do. Realizing this is not about attaching to another viewpoint, it's about acknowledging a vital, formless dance. The narrow focus on thinking is shifted to the fuller happening of the moment, the totally mysterious, sounding, silencing, lightning, darkening, warming, cooling, pulsing, tingling, trembling event that this moment is. All sense of directing or understanding this happening evaporates. This isn't some state of mind that we create, it's simply the acknowledgement of what is. All notions of being something separate from this event disappear. The word I is merely a pointer like the phrase over there. Whether we look inward, I or outward, over there, all that's found is a vital, pulsing dynamic. With this realization, the word I can only point to a vibrant, formless happening. It's not a person with a history. It's natural for life to present itself as confusion and clarity, anxiety and confidence, sadness and happiness, horror and beauty and so on. These illusions of form come and go. They're born, they age, and they eventually die, but the unformed liveliness that actually is, is always present, always unform. It's all that ever is. We don't have to train ourselves to be part of the flow, Everything we appear to be and everything we appear to think, say, and do, all the wonderful stuff and all the ordinary, mundane, unattractive, unhealthy, foolish stuff, is already the divine, mysterious flow. That's all there is. From a small view, it may seem unfair that some get relatively easy lives while others get very difficult situations, but the event that existence is can't be understood as fair or unfair. It's simply a great, mysterious, and often painful dance. Spiritual disciplines are not meant to balance the cosmos, nor perfect it. The wholeness that existence is is already balanced in every moment. It's a simple matter to realize that all of existence is unformed. We can realize that all things in the external world are changing, and looking inward, we find the same shifting event. Unformed in here, unformed out there, it's one unformed happening. There is no in here or out there, it's one event. Certain Hindu traditions have the phrase, I am that, signifying the undivided nature of all things. The word universe literally means undivided turning. 
whether we're astronomers observing galaxies blipping out of existence in the far regions of the universe, or we're meditators noticing the disappearing out-breath, all that's ever found is an unformed liveliness. All things are motion. It's foolishness to label some of it birth and some of it death, because all that ever exists is an ongoing absence of form. How many times in your life have you heard someone say that everything changes? This isn't some strange belief, it's everyone's experience of existence. In ignoring the vibrant, formless dance that everything actually is, the focus falls on the mirage of form, a me, and a world. In general, if it shifts beyond the form of me, it falls on another illusion of form, us, the human race. Existence isn't about a me or an us or a world. It's an unformed, indefinable happening simply happening. As long as there's the belief that we are separate from and in control of this event, there can never be any true compassion. Instead, there is the arrogance of personal accomplishment or failure, a sense of superiority or inferiority. To realize that all things, including you, are an inexplicable movement spontaneously expressing itself, yields wonder and amazement at all of its apparent manifestations. Ultimately honoring so-called individuals for their accomplishments, or denouncing them for their failures, is an act of delusion. We're not self-made. No one directs his or her manifestation. No one deserves credit or blame for it. The morality of humankind is not held in place with preaching. Every society has within it some sense of what the tribe allows and what it does not. This has arisen in the same way language has arisen. It's inherent in the movement of nature. None of us decided there would be language, and none of us decided there would be a moral sensibility. As our various so-called cultures apparently emerged, a refined sense of morality has emerged. Each apparent culture and each apparent individual in that culture has a different sense of what's right and wrong. Once again, nature manifests in diverse and unique ways. There are enough similarities, however, to give the mistaken impression that there is a common human morality. As a result, most people consider their own to be the common one and condemn all others. Again, there is this arrogance. There can be no common morality. Each of us exhibits a unique sense of what we can and cannot do, and what we can live with afterwards. Variations may be large and obvious, or they may be small and subtle. Fortunately, human beings aren't generally vicious. This can change in extreme situations of war or deprivation. Various time periods exhibit varying moral standards, and the so-called person at various so-called times behaves in different ways. Generally the fluctuations aren't large, but they can be. Reincarnation is a fantasy. Existence has never had a form that could be repeated. The shifting of galaxies on the far side of the universe is the same shifting event of bodies and minds. This happening has no particular form. There is no thing becoming some other thing. There's one great unformed event always remaining unformed. You don't believe a bear-shaped cloud is really a bear. If the cloud changes shape to look like a horse, you don't believe the bear died and became a horse. You don't actually believe there is a bear or a horse, it's always obviously an unformed happening called a cloud. You and I are not things becoming other things, we're an unformed happening. Ideas of form don't apply to this. Realization of this is not a matter of describing anything. Realization terminates the strong focus on thoughts and interpretations. Instead, there's a simple acknowledgement of the larger mysterious dance that this moment is. Quite obviously, the present moment has no form. Quite obviously, this is the nature of existence. 
It's easy to acknowledge that planets are a movement of the universe and that the Earth moves to the rhythms of nature. Landmasses shift, weather changes, plants grow, animals reproduce, bodies develop and other bodies are delivered and mature in the biological cycle. Hearts beat. Breath comes and goes. Blood circulates. Immune systems operate. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling and thinking simply happens. All of this occurs without any effort whatsoever. Moods shift, ideas alter, perceptions change, it simply occurs. We are this event, we don't exist as anything apart from it, yet somehow we have the belief that we're doing it. Every religion ultimately points to an indefinable presence that is the ground of all existence. Whether it's the unfathomable God of the Bible, the enigmatic Asankata of the Buddhist scriptures, or the inexplicable, unformed ocean of the Ashtavakra Gita, the story is the same. Scientists like Albert Einstein and David Bohm declare that every so-called thing in existence is actually an indefinable event. Science and religion ultimately point to a simple, observable fact. All of existence is a vital presence that can't, in any true way, be described. That includes you. True humility is realizing this event or presence. Realizing this destroys the illusion of an independent will and the arrogance of credit or blame. Judgment is replaced by wonder and amazement at the infinite variety of nature's appearances in seeing that each of us is one of those appearances. If we sit quietly, making no effort, life expresses itself clearly, it simply happens on its own. There's nothing else to get. The great truth is obvious. The heart beats, the breath comes and goes. Vibrations, pulsations, twinges, feelings, thoughts and emotions rise and fall. Urges rise and pass, some become actions, others do not, and so life flows. Clarity and confusion, joy and sorrow, hope and despair and so on, are some of the alternating appearances of that flow. Even if we try not to move at some point we're compelled to act. We eat when hungry and sleep when tired. Being the movement of certain pulsations, vibrations, needs, interests, urges and act ions, we automatically function in some way. This process simply happens. Athletes, artists, intellectuals, parents, politicians and so on do not choose their hopes and dreams. There can be no sense of peace until we realize we're an indefinable activity. All things, all act ions, all thoughts, words and deeds are the passing appearances and expressions of a great unformed, indefinable event, whose behavior is free to go in any direction whatsoever. Each of us must live according to the physical and mental capacities that nature presents centered on the only needs, interests, and concerns that mysteriously arise in any moment. We don't exist as anything apart from that. Realizing this imposes an unshakable humility. Not the self-absorbed piety of cultivated virtues, instead it's the acknowledgement that we can't take credit or blame for anything. No one can. We can't judge others for their behavior, our apparent doing and their apparent doing is a movement of the universe according to its physical makeup. Nothing else is possible. The average person fears this, imagining this way of seeing will bring some type of disaster. Perhaps we'll stop making effort altogether and society will fall apart. Perhaps we'll become totally irresponsible. After all, if life isn't our doing, it's not our responsibility. But, this is a misunderstanding of what's being said. This is not a situation where you can choose to stop functioning. Instead, it's the realization that your functioning and non-functioning have never been your creation. 
All of the healthy, responsible, caring behavior that you've exhibited in life has been the impersonal movement of nature, just as all of the unhealthy, confused, and harmful behavior has been. There is no you apart from this event. Seeing this doesn't allow you to leave this process or lose control of it, there is only this process. Nothing else is evident, nothing else has ever been. Love and a sense of responsibility are not a personal accomplishment, they're the expression of nature. Everything is. Upon realizing this, respect arises for all of life's manifestations, the horror of some, the enchantment of others, and the wonder of it all. There's an endless tolerance in knowing that we don't create ourselves. There's compassion in knowing that all of us share this situation. Life isn't merely a gentle, soothing experience. Mother Nature is bountiful in her expression, but she also eats her young. In the past, there were symbols that accurately reflected this situation. Dark, powerful, mysterious figures like Shiva and Kali. Nowadays, we seem to emphasize love and peace as the true nature of existence and everything else as some kind of defilement. This isn't a very good preparation for life as it actually is. The full and natural expression of life's dance includes the extremely pleasant and the extremely unpleasant. The perceiving process searches for patterns and formations in life's flow. This obsessive focus on the mirage of form gives rise to a sense of separation and insecurity. There is the futile hope of finding something stable to cling to, a pleasure and understanding, a feeling and so on. But, the search for something stable is endlessly frustrating. There is only flow, unprovoked, unstoppable, ungraspable and inexplicable. It's not our failure if life doesn't do what we want, because it's not moving to our command. In any particular moment, life is capable of moving in a direction that isn't wanted, and try as we might, individually and collectively, we can't stop it. We don't exist as anything apart from this flow. Our bodies, needs, interests, understandings and abilities are the movement of nature and each expression of nature is unique. If it presents an unusually attractive being from time to time, it's of no relevance to the rest of us. We can admire someone the way we admire a sunset, but we can't use that person as a model for all of us, any more than we can pick one sunset and say that all of them should be that. How much happiness would come from rejecting all expressions of nature except one? Some teachers declare that we must work to develop morality, wisdom, and the lessening of personal greed. They attract those with a similar attitude. Gathered together, they find it such a pity that others can't see the truth they see, but it's a delusion to think that everyone should be concerned with your particular approach to life. The nature of existence gives rise to each of our expressions in the same way it sends various birds on their particular migration routes. Even in the case of those that appear to get the same route, they don't occupy the same position in the flock, each is a unique expression. Whatever you're compelled to be in life, be it, but assuming that everyone should be it is ridiculous. To believe that your way is the only way is like a duck thinking all birds should be ducks. When a goose flies south in winter, he's not wondering why every other bird isn't following him, and he's not pitying the other birds for not knowing the one true migration route. He doesn't try to convince robins and sparrows to give up their lifestyles for his. If this so-called enlightenment occurs, it's the simple acknowledgement that every apparent thing in existence is an inexplicable event accomplishing itself. Looking outward, there's an inexplicable happening. Looking inward, there's an inexplicable happening. Unformed there, unformed here, it's an unformed, undivided, indecipherable dance doing what it does. The so-called awakening is not necessarily pleasant. The impression that existence is being understood and directed melts away, 
to be replaced with absolute puzzlement. It's common for childhood views to fall away and be replaced with adult views. In some, the usual adult views will fall away to be replaced with extreme views. In a few others, however, there's the end of belief in any view. The focus of attention is shifted away from thoughts and views, as it becomes obvious that any moment is a larger, inexplicable happening. This initial shift can be confusing and frightening. All descriptions are invalidated, and the sense of free will is eradicated. Even this shift is felt to be occurring independently of what's wanted, it occurs whether it's wanted or not. It's not the result of personal effort, it's the movement of existence itself. This realization can never be wanted beforehand, because it's the end of all beliefs, hopes and dreams. It's the end of a describable self. This so-called awakening can never be wanted, but it may happen nonetheless. This isn't some fleeting mood and it's not the loss of reality, it's the fading away of fantasy. What remains is a mysterious dance spontaneously expressing itself as all apparent things, a magical parade of passing appearances. Spiritual awakening is often described as the movement into silence, but this can be misleading. It's not a physical silence being described. Instead, the vital, pulsing, sounding event that actually is becomes more evident than ever before. The silence is the end of attachment to descriptions. The intellectually noisy attachment to frantic thinking and all of its apparent side effects is lessened or silenced and the larger, enigmatic dance of the moment comes into focus. There's no struggle to hold it in place since it has no form. There's no ache to understand it since it's totally indecipherable. There's no longing for more than what it is, since whatever arises in each moment is all that's possible. There's no oppressive urge to impose any standard, since each expression is unique. Fears of death no longer make sense, there is only the unfathomable dance of the cosmos. Credit and blame no longer make sense. Pride and shame dissolve and the judging of others becomes impossible. Obsessive thought, struggle, desire, conformity, fear, pride, shame and judgment are silenced in various ways and the vital, buzzing event of the moment remains. Existence expresses itself in shifting appearances, light, dark, sound, silence, warm, cold, joy, sorrow, clarity, confusion, hope, regret and so on, always shifting from pleasant to unpleasant, back again to pleasant and repeating. This shifting isn't a failure on anyone's part, it's the essential expression of existence. This is our reality, always moving to different expressions, forever displaying various appearances viewed as opposites. But, they're not opposites, they're the many faces of one dynamic. Waking up to this essential flow doesn't get rid of it, nor the difficulties of it, but unnecessary struggles and confusions will fall away if it's realized that this is life's natural expression. The realization that nature expresses itself regardless of our wants can be a frightening proposition, but it's never been any other way. Think this will not promote a slide into disaster. Existence has always expressed both ups and downs, that's its nature, and there's no need to fantasize that it will become entirely negative if this is seen clearly. The wonderful thing about this process is that it generally moves to love. Not the personal love that most people think of, instead, it's an unconditional openness to life. As we appear to grow older, the fight against life's expression generally fades as the energies of useless opposition grow tired. It's the flowering of all that we are without it needing to be anything else. A difficult aspect of this flowering is its ordinariness. As the grandiose illusions of youth fade, it all seems so mundane, but it's not. 
Each of us is an integral and unique appearance of the universe. Everything we appear to be and all that we appear to think, say, and do is the automatic and inexplicable dance of the cosmos. It doesn't matter what part we play, hero or villain, it's a natural expression of existence. Ultimately, as all spiritual teachings indicate, nothing is ever gained or lost. The great, unformed, and inexplicable event that existence is remains unformed and inexplicable. In old age and death, the melodramatic views of youth recede and the vastness of our situation pushes forward, silencing all objections to it. As we become frail and willful energies subside, what has always been becomes obvious, we are life's flow. Even those of us who become delusional will play out our part without any conscious effort. The fearful urge to keep life under control is based in fantasy. It's the fantasy of thinking oneself separate from the movement of existence, thinking that we direct this movement and that we had better direct it or it will fall apart. There's a universal urge to acknowledge a greater power, but the fantasy of a self ruling the world usually takes precedence and is believed to be the truth. Life is an unformed flowing, yet the focus of attention is almost always on illusions of form and the fantasies of people doing things in a world. If the indecipherable dance of existence is realized, it puts an end to belief in descriptions of me and mine, my life and my doing. That conflicted belief evaporates in a sense of relief and rest. The idea of spiritual life versus worldly life is a misconception. Everyone is already living the most spiritual life possible because everything, in any moment, is completely spirit. The spontaneous, unformed, inexplicable swirl that everything actually is. Human arrogance is the feeling that we're superior to everything else in the cosmos, and that some of us are more highly developed than others of our kind. We either take credit for our superiority while passing judgment on the shortcomings of others, or if we're one of the so-called inferior, we take the blame for not being much of anything at all. This is an interesting view, since everything else in existence, the sun, the moon, the clouds, the seasons, the weather, the animals, and so on, are seen to be the varied and fascinating expressions of nature, none superior to another. A bird or a planet is not seen to be directing its particular development. Everything is generally considered to be an expression of the mysterious dance that existence is. Everything except for one thing, us. Somehow, there's the belief that we're directing the dance. This must mean we exist somewhere outside of it. The idea that our bodies, abilities, and actions occur somewhere outside the flow of nature is very strange. Where and how are we existing, if not as part of nature's expression? We can't truly say what this event of existence is. Even the sense of existing disappears every night, only to reappear. It's like a light blinking off and on. When it's on, our so-called life appears in its flow. Bodies, needs, interests, concerns, urges, and act ions. Family situations, national events, international events. All of these arise and fade as passing appearances of a formless event. There may be hope that life will move in a certain way, but hope doesn't create the potential for that movement. Maybe the potential exists, maybe it doesn't. Life isn't a willful act, it's a mysterious happening, unpredictably expressing itself. You wouldn't go to a tropical island paradise just to sit in a hotel reading the brochures that describe the sun, the sand, and the surf. In that situation, it's very easy to see that those descriptions do not contain the fullness, vibrancy, and joy of the actual event called an island paradise, and we would never be content to simply sit in the hotel reading. Yet most of us do this with life in general, being obsessively focused on the stories of thought, 
the brochures of the mind. Spiritual awakening realizes the ultimate emptiness of description. Instead, there's an interest in life itself, the unformed, inexplicable, vibrant, dancing fullness that this moment actually is. It's incorrect to describe existence as individuals influencing life or as life influencing individuals. Perceptual process mistakenly views the formless flow of existence as separate forms influencing each other or as a journey from one phase to another. It even mistakenly thinks there's a perceptual process. I'm not telling anyone to go with the flow because there is only flow. I'm not saying bring yourself into alignment with the movement of life because there is only movement, there is no you apart from it. There's no possible way for you to be out of alignment with the flow of existence, there is only that. Chapter Shades of Advaita We are the unformed flow of existence itself, we're already and eternally that. You don't need to acquire anything new, just give up false ideas. Outside the fantasies of thought, there are no entities called self and world. There is no creation or destruction, free will or destiny, ignorance or enlightenment. There is no wandering in the wilderness and coming to the light. Our real nature is liberation. We are the unconstrained dance of the cosmos itself. We imagine we're bound as separate individuals and make strenuous efforts to be free, when all the while we're already free. We ignore the unformed, inexplicable dance that life is, and imagine forms of body and mind to be reality. It's this mistaken belief in form that gives rise to misery. Chapter Reflections 3 our apparent needs, interests and concerns come together as an apparent thirst. It may be the thirst for love, understanding, adventure, money, power, knowledge, family and so on. It may be one or more of these. This thirst will adjust itself from moment to moment. It may be as simple and direct as needing a meal or wanting entertainment, or it may be as complex and long-term as needing children or wanting to understand existence. Whatever it is in any moment, it pushes itself forward, setting all priorities. Realizing that everything is the impersonal flow of nature doesn't make every moment clear and pleasant, it's just as much the expression of nature to be vague and unpleasant. The ordinary human mind, in any moment, with all of its apparent confusions, sorrows and wants, is already the complete and natural expression of the divine, the unformed, the Tao Buddha mind, God, Brahma and so on. These are the various labels for the inexplicable happening that everything is. When it's realized that every thought, word and deed is the natural expression of existence then you're free to move without the conflict of feeling defective or incompetent. The dance of existence isn't defective or incompetent in any way. Spiritual liberation frees you from the misery inducing fantasy of perfecting yourself. In this moment, I am what I am, you are what you are, we're both the dance of the cosmos. Liberation isn't the act of breaking free of this. Liberation is knowing it can't be otherwise. Just as a growing plant contains all the direction it needs to be the plant that it is, we contain all the direction we need to be the person that we are. Everything in existence has an innate intelligence, an essential current expressing itself. Whatever you are in any moment is the expression of that current. There is only that current or flow, that's what everything is. An ocean doesn't direct its own movement, it doesn't need to struggle to express its true nature. In each moment, it's all that it can possibly be, each wave, ripple and swirl is fine. Fantasized notions of perfection and standards of conformity are a denial of life's flow, a denial of life's expression. Stories of individuals falling from purity to defilement are a fantasy. Nothing has fallen anywhere, 
everything is always the complete and natural expression of existence or, if you prefer, the expression of God. Your fullness is whatever arises in any particular moment. This can't be classified as spiritual or worldly, it can't be classified as right or wrong, there's no way of saying what any of this actually is. The general statement that life is about spiritual awakening or the development of wisdom and compassion is incorrect. That statement is merely the propaganda of groups primarily focused on spiritual matters. Life exhibits no observable goal other than expressing itself in diverse and unique ways. For every apparent person primarily focused on wisdom and compassion, there are many who aren't. It's not that they failed to realize a truth, they're simply a different expression of existence, an expression that's just as valid as any other. If you're practicing forgiveness, forgiving others for their behavior, be aware that you're primarily practicing judgment and blame. Before you can forgive someone you must first make them guilty of an offense. This is a denial of life. Our urges and actions are expressions of nature. No one can be blamed for being the particular arrangement of abilities, urges and actions they are. Some expressions of existence are naturally considered to be unpleasant or even dangerous and we will respond automatically to that unpleasantness or danger. However, just as a volcano doesn't need to be forgiven for its unpleasant or dangerous behavior, neither does any person. There is the notion that all awakened beings will behave in the same way, matching some societal fantasy of what a saint should be. In actuality they come in all sizes, shapes and temperaments, some are not pleasant. They all see themselves as the inexplicable dance of existence, but this doesn't make them conform to some fantasy of perfection. It doesn't even necessarily make them sociable. Truth, reality, God, however you want to label it, is a vital presence, a dynamic event. It's not a particular object, idea, feeling, mood, and so on. It's the inexplicable flow of existence, and we've never been anything apart from that. Existence can be summed up in one short Zen verse, sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes, grass grows by itself. The same is true of everything, the aging of the body, the movement of thoughts and moods, urges to act ion, and actions themselves. Everything simply happens, like spring coming and grass growing. Sitting quietly, you'll find that whatever you are in any particular moment presents itself automatically. Needs, interests, and concerns push themselves to the front and play out in whatever way they do. In certain times, it's light and calm, in others, dark and stormy. In each moment, it's a totally mysterious event doing what it does. Sitting quietly, making no effort, all is revealed, a vibrant, pulsing, formless happening, simply happening. There is no goal in this, no final point. There is only what expresses itself in this moment, and whatever it appears to be now is unavoidably on its way to some other appearance. One of the delusions of ego is that it operates outside of the flow of cause and effect and that it's able to influence that stream by introducing something new to it. But, it's never been anything separate from that flow, something that could inject anything new. Improvements appear to occur, just as downturns do, but these are the rhythmic expressions of nature, the waves of a mighty ocean. It's not anyone's personal achievement or failure. Anyone who appears to produce something of benefit to themselves or to the world at large is compelled to do so. The fascination with a particular subject, an urge to explore, an intuition, a thought, an ability, or a fortunate accident, is never anyone's personal creation. When Einstein was complimented on his discovery of the theory of relativity, he would say it simply happened, that he didn't make it happen. 
There are myriad stories of scientists investigating various subjects and in a moment when they were relaxing or sleeping making no effort whatsoever, not even focusing on their interest, some great discovery popped up in a thought, a vision or a dream. This is not a matter of discovery, this is simply the inexplicable dance of existence expressing itself. We can't have up without down joy, without sorrow, confidence, without anxiety, and so on. These are the natural expressions of life. If existence appears to move one way now, it will move in the apparently opposite direction at some point. This has nothing to do with anyone's efforts. This is the natural rhythm of existence. There's nothing we can do to change this. Even if we live in the wisest way possible, existence will continue to express itself in this manner. Life is always a unique blend of apparent opposites, and there's no me that gets to choose the mix. The waxing and waning of emotions and states of mind are like the flowing of the seasons. We may anticipate them and prepare for them, but we can't prevent them. We don't exist as anything apart from that flow. If I say to you there is no me, no you, no self, no world, no thinking, no personal actions, no forms of any kind, I'm not talking about some experience that's different from yours. This is not describing some altered state, I'm pointing to the basic happening that you are right now, it's simply being acknowledged precisely. Spiritual awakening or enlightenment doesn't add anything more to what's existing. Instead, it's the fading away of fantasies. What then remains is what has been here all along, an inexplicable dance. When I say that's what remains, don't get the idea of some strange experience without thought. What is usually called a me, a you, a self, and a world including thought that still happens, but there's no longer any obsessive belief in those false forms and labels. Instead, the absolutely inexplicable movement, or unformed flowing, that everything is becomes obvious. Chapter, Question and Answer Part 2 Question, I want to ask you about the basic qualities that are said to arise with spiritual awakening, such as compassion, detachment and harmony. You've touched on some of these already, but I want to take more time with them. I thought we could start with a consideration of compassion. Within most spiritual circles, the theme of compassion is very strong. We're urged to cultivate it, and it's often coupled with wisdom as the ultimate expression of existence. Daryl, yes, people in spiritual circles often believe that wisdom and compassion are the goals of existence. They fantasize that an awakened being becomes some extraordinary fountain of love, giving endlessly to the greater good of humankind. They tend to ignore the stories of enlightened beings who, upon awakening, left society to live on their own. Awakened beings don't gain the power to throw off their personalities, they continue to be expressions of nature. It's ironic that people have preconceived notions of what an enlightened personality is or how that personality will behave because each expression of nature is unique. Some teach, some don't. Some talk, some don't. Some enjoy society, some don't. Some are pleasant personalities, some not. Some are married, some single. Some sexual, some celibate. Some live in a traditional religious environment, others do not. Some sit quietly for long periods, others don't. Some seem to make sense, others seem to be crazy. And so on. What they have in common is the absolute certainty that everything is an unformed, inexplicable happening presenting itself. Realizing this mysterious dance gives rise to a natural tolerance for all of life's expressions. Not only a tolerance, but the acknowledgement and appreciation that everyone is a unique expression and has to be that particular expression. This is the compassion of awakening. It doesn't necessarily mean we like all things or endlessly serve others, 
but we can appreciate that everything must be whatever it is in any particular moment. Some awakened beings appear to serve in extraordinary ways, others appear to be nothing more than mildly good-natured, some may even appear be grouchy and intolerant. No one knows what any of this actually is and anyone who says they do is deluded. Question, what about harmony? How does harmony arise? Daryl, harmony is contentment with life as it is, with all of its inevitable expressions. Seeing that everything is an expression of the cosmos, there's no longer the desire for anything more than what it offers. Question, how do we know what it offers? Daryl, whatever happens is what it offers. There's never any mistake, because all of life is the impersonal expression of nature. Question, and seeing this is detachment. Daryl, yes. It eventually doesn't matter what thought wants, because the various expressions of nature don't move to the wishes of thought. Thought is simply one of the various expressions. Anything that appears to arise is unavoidably on its way to another expression, so why get attached to any of it? This is not saying that with detachment there will never be desire, sorrow, confusion, anxiety, and so on. It's not saying that you won't participate in society. Life will continue to express whatever it expresses, but there's no extended concern over anything that happens. All of it is felt to be the complete and natural movement of existence. That's detachment. Question, what about love? In the Advaita tradition one often hears old masters saying things like, you are not the body, you are not the mind, there is only love. Daryl, yes that's the traditional expression, Robert Adams used to say it all the time. Love, in its highest philosophical sense, is an openness to all that life offers. Everything, just as it is in any particular moment, is the complete and natural expression of existence moving to its inherent nature. Love is the simple acknowledgement of that. Found spiritual teachings are not prescriptions for perfecting life. They simply point to the already complete and pure expression of existence. There's the realization that everything is happening the only way it can. Realizing this brings a sense of contentment to life with all of its apparent joys, sorrows, conflicts, and brutalities. Again, be careful with this. It's not saying that you'll sit around doing nothing and never oppose or pursue anything. It's simply saying that whatever happens, in any apparent moment, is the unavoidable expression of existence. Nothing else is possible. In spiritual circles we're often urged to move deep within ourselves to find a place of peace, but this is misleading. The place of our life is always the fullness of the present moment. Awakening isn't about moving to a different place, it's about a different sense of the same place. As long as there's the fantasy that you're directing existence, life will never be enough. With the realization that everything is a movement of the cosmos, an underlying sense of peace, well-being, and openness is present in some variation, no matter what happens, because all of it is felt to be the natural dance of existence. That peace, well-being, and openness is often called love. Question. How does humility arise? Daryl, what could be more humbling than to discover you're not personally responsible for anything you think, say, and do? You can no longer praise yourself for positive things, they can only be appreciated. You can no longer wallow in self-pity or recrimination for any so-called negative things, they can only be lived out. A belief in personal doing is replaced with the simple acknowledgement of life's mysterious dance. This is not some cold, sterile situation. It's exactly the same event that is usually perceived as people in a world. The labels and stories still arise as part of the flow, but there's no sense of understanding any of it. It simply happens, a vibrantly rich and magical parade of appearances.
Question, when all is said and done, where does this leave us? Daryl, we continue to be whatever nature expresses in any particular moment. The ignorant assumption that it could ever be otherwise comes to an end. Life will not express itself in a continuously calm and clear fashion. In certain periods, there can be stomach-twisting, head-pounding energies pushing and pulling in many directions, with no indication of how it will all play out. The natural current of life is showing itself, just as much in periods of intense vagueness and confusion as it is in periods of certainty and clarity. The average so-called person isn't comfortable as the process they are. Most of us feel inadequate or inferior to others who appear to be more competent and happy. The most judgmental human beings are often the students of spiritual teachings. Not because they intentionally want to judge others, but because they carry the fantasy of a perfect being in hope to become that. This hopeful fantasy doesn't allow for periods of confusion, anger, jealousy, fear, aggression, and so on. Many people view those expressions as being tainted and distorted in some way and will fall into periods of self-loathing for exhibiting this natural human behavior. Can you imagine a robin covering its face with its wing as it breaks down sobbing, I can't believe I chirp and eat worms. Why, why, why can't I get rid of this behavior? You laugh, but is it any different from a meditator sobbing, why do I still get angry, jealous, fearful, and confused? How many of us have prepared ourselves to act in a reasonable, calm manner when anticipating an upcoming stressful situation, but when the moment actually arrives, we find ourselves emotionally unhinged? This isn't our personal failure. It's the fact that our will is not ruling existence. We're a movement of nature, and, no matter what the mind wishes, we have to be whatever nature expresses in any particular moment. If there's a profound realization of this, there can be moments of absolute clarity regarding the truth of it, the feeling that there is nowhere else to get to, and nothing else to be other than whatever presents itself in each instant. All of it is a fascinating and totally inexplicable event presenting itself. Initially, even with deep realization, this clarity can alternate with the old illusion of being someone separate from the world, a someone desperately needing understanding and control. At first, there will be the desire for this fluctuation to end, leaving only the feeling of clarity, but as it becomes obvious that this fluctuation is also life's natural expression, it ceases to be worrisome. At times, existence may literally feel like one great ocean moving and shifting, and at other times, that universal sense may be barely noticeable. Eventually though the idea that life is our doing comes to an end. Right now, my favorite spiritual story is one of a Zen master who's dying and his students have gathered to witness his passing. Zen masters have a reputation for uttering something profound just before they expire. There was one who, upon hearing a squirrel running across the roof tiles, sat up proclaiming just this, nothing more before falling back dead. Others have uttered marvelous poems on the links between human life and nature's flow. Consequently, these particular students are waiting in great anticipation for the final moments. The master is having trouble speaking, so he's given paper and brush to enable him to make a statement. He writes something, hands the paper back, and the students read, I don't want to die. Surprised by this, since it seems to express desire, and believing that Zen masters are beyond such human traits, the students immediately assume it must have a deeper meaning. They again give the master paper and brush, begging him to explain the real meaning of his words. Once more the old man writes something and gives the paper back. This time the students read, I really, really don't want to die. Point is this, the master is free to be whatever he is, without apology or regret. The students, however, live in fantasies of what life should be, 
They're unable to acknowledge the simple facts of the moment, the simple expression of existence. In this moment, you may love your life or you may hate it. You may be confused and frightened or clear and calm. You may be on a spiritual path or a course of crime. You may be a worldly success or a failure. You may be living to feed the poor or living only to acquire money. You may be anything a human being can appear to be, and not for one moment have you stopped being the complete and pure expression of existence. Question. That seems like the perfect note to end on. Thank you for taking the time and trouble to do this. Daryl, I'm not doing this and you're welcome. Chapter, End, Notes This book is primarily composed of fragments from conversations with various people over many years. Taoist echoes and shades of Advaita were prompted by the teachings of the Taoist masters, Lao Tzu, Chuan Tzu, and Li Tzu, and the 20th century Advaita master, Ramana Maharshi, as presented in the works of Timothy Freak and David Godman respectively. Echoes and shades were originally much longer pieces for my own enjoyment. They're not a collection of exact quotations, but carry the essential message of the original texts. Advaita is an ancient teaching of India, so is Buddhism. Taoism is an early teaching of China. Tanzen also began in China, and is basically Buddhism, mixed with Taoism. Chapter About the Author Spontaneously drawn to meditation at age 14, Daryl spent the next 17 years exploring the awareness and concentration teachings of Buddhism, Taoism, Sufism, Hinduism, Christianity, and Western psychology. He then spent nine years apprentice to mindfulness teacher Ruth Dennison and another six years as a meditation monk in the Thai forest tradition of Theravada Buddhism, under the guidance of Ajahn Sumedho. Along the way, there was recurring contact with the independent philosopher Jiddu Krishnamurti and a significant connection with the Advaita sage Robert Adams. Daryl has worked as an ice fisherman, bus driver, suit salesman, carpenter, child care worker, and maintenance man, among other things. He has lived and taught in England, Switzerland, and the United States. He currently lives, works, and teaches in Winnipeg, Canada.